I will request our Honorable Principal Madam, Dr. Papia Chakraborty, to officially welcome all the participants and the speakers. Dr. Chakraborty. Welcome you all to the second day. This was a very fruitful day one. And we are hoping we'll get a very good knowledge of this uh, virus which, we, uh, which has affected the whole globe and we all are concerned about. Now, this, uh, this lethal coronavirus which uh, occurred in China in December 2019, this has provoked the governments across the world to introduce emergency containment and control measures and we are undergoing the, that system also here. So the, uh, to prevent the collapse of the national healthcare system, we are trying hard and scientists are trying hard all over the world to address the issues in, from different aspects. So today we are, will welcome our uh, scientists and doctors from all over the world. First, I welcome Dr. Ken, Kenneth Schindler, who will speak on the clinical perspectives, our speaker one. And uh, subsequently, I really th I'm really thankful to Professor Jayasri Dasharma, who has uh, collaborated with all our um, foreign scientists and made this uh, seminar a very nice one. And, uh, I hope we'll get it. And I'm thankful to Dr. Ravi Mahalingam for his kind uh, cooperation. And uh, of course, he'll speak on his own uh, work. And also Dr. Devnath Pal, who will speak on the in silico analysis of the spike proteins and how the drug targeting can be done. So I hope today's seminar will go on with uh, knowledge from all aspects, how to combat COVID-19, this pandemic. And of course, the role of biotechnology is essential and the whole world is now uh, dependent on the biotechnologies. So thank you all and welcome once again. Thank you, madam. Uh, now I will request Dr. Nilakshi Sharkar to take over for the technical session. Dr. Sharkar. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And welcome, everyone. Uh, Dr. Schindler, Dr. Schindler, Dr. Ravi Mahalingam, Dr. Jaisri, and Dr. Devnath Pal, thank you very much for being a part of this session. The coronavirus outbreak came to light on December 31st, 2019, when China first informed the World Health Organization about it. This currently rampaging SARS coronavirus 2 belongs to the genus Beta coronavirus and is about 80% genetically identical to the older SARS coronavirus, one that infected humans 18 years ago. Whereas murine coronavirus is a prototype beta coronavirus and best explored experimental animal model for studying respiratory, enteric, hepatic, as well as neurological manifestations. Fortunately, the intervening several decades has allowed researchers to study both murine and human beta coronavirus in great detail. And among such researchers, we have four eminent speakers with us today. Our first speaker of this test for today's session is Dr. Kenneth Schindler. Dr. Schindler received combined MD and PhD degrees with a PhD in neuroscience from Washington University in St. Louis. He completed ophthalmology residency and neuro-ophthalmology fellowship from the University of Pennsylvania, where Dr. Schindler is currently an associate professor of ophthalmology and neurology. He also serves as a faculty member at the Neuroscience Graduate Group and the Institute for Immunology. The main focus of Dr. Schindler's research is to understand mechanisms of neuronal damage during optic neuritis. Clinically, he sees patients with neurologic problems. Dr. Schindler has been honored with the North American Neuroophthalmology Society Young Investigator Award the American Academy of Ophthalmology Achievement Award, and the Research to Prevent Blindness Physician Scientist Award. Today, he shall discuss with us the clinical perspectives of coronavirus infection. Thank you. Dr. Schindler? Dr. Schindler? 
mute. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Thank you so much for that oh, screen sharing. Start screen sharing. Says the host has disabled particip participant screen sharing. Will I be given access? Go ahead, Dr. Schindler. It's been uh, activated. Oh, okay. Share my screen. All right. So thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation to be involved in, in this excellent webinar. Uh, and thank you for the very kind uh, invitation. Uh, I am going to be speaking today on some clinical perspectives uh, in my as my role as a clinician uh, in, uh, in as far as the COVID-19 pandemic is in general and how health systems and governments have responded to this outbreak. I'm also going to focus a little bit specifically on neurologic complications of this uh, outbreak uh, based on my expertise. And, and I'll touch on some of the experimental methods that we use to try and understand coronavirus infections in general, which my colleagues uh, who were just introduced will talk more about in the subsequent lectures. Uh, so I have no financial conflicts of interest relative to the, this talk today. Uh, as a brief overview, I'm gonna talk about the pandemic and the effects, on, uh, the effects of global lockdown strategies on the spread of this virus, some of the clinical perspectives globally, uh, I will turn to optic neuritis as a disease model for a mouse coronavirus to give an example of how we can understand neurologic complications of coronaviruses. Uh, and then I'll mention some of the neurologic manifestation, manifestations of COVID-19 specifically. Uh, so as you all are likely aware and heard some about yesterday and in the introductions, coronaviruses uh, are RNA viruses. They're common in both humans and animals. And there are some zoonotic strains that have spread from animal sources to humans. The spike protein that gives the coronavirus its name uh, is a key mediator of host cell entry and viral spread that you're going to hear much more about from Dr. Desharma in the next lecture. Uh, as we heard, this particular coronavirus uh, emerged uh, in December of 2019, first in China, uh, but it's one of three coronaviruses that um, have caused outbreaks in this century, uh, and uh, all are believed to have spread from natural uh, reservoirs in animals, specifically in bats, and then been transferred to an intermediary animal and subsequently uh, into humans where they began to spread from human to human, uh, causing the, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 virus causing the current pandemic. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was first detected in Wuhan, China in December 2019. And many of the early cases were associated with workers from live animal markets in Wuhan. Uh, one of the earliest, one of the early studies showed that 27 of 41 original patients had ties to a specific seafood market in Wuhan. However, the first, the very first case identified, that patient had no link to the animal market. And there's emerging evidence to suggest that there was very early spread from human to human, uh, perhaps much earlier than we thought uh, at first and clearly shows that there's much more that needs to be learned and understood about this virus, which will be a recurrent theme throughout uh, the talks. But COVID-19 is the disease that the SARS-CoV-2 virus causes, and the disease itself is highly variable. There are many cases where patients have very mild symptoms or are completely asymptomatic, uh, but the most common symptoms are uh, typical of other respiratory viruses, uh, including fever, cough, and upper respiratory congestion. And that uh, can make it difficult to determine whether someone has COVID-19 versus some other type of viral respiratory infection uh, in the absence of effective testing uh, for various virus, viruses and other pathogens. In its more severe forms, COVID-19 
typically involves lung inflammation and pneumonia, uh, which can lead to respiratory failure from acute respiratory distress syndrome and is the most uh, common cause of mortality in patients with COVID-19. Uh, uh, some of the severe complications may also be caused by a secondary hyperactive immune response uh, or so-called cytokine storm that occurs in response to the virus as opposed to direct effects of the virus itself. In addition to the pulmonary effects of this disease, it is now recognized that there are many other clinical features uh, affecting numerous parts of the body, including uh, cardiac complications, neurologic complications, which I'll touch on, uh, as well as a delayed multi-system immune disease that's beginning to emerge in children following the infection with COVID-19. So why is this disease spread across the world? Well, it's partly because mild or asymptomatic cases contribute to viral spread. Uh, because patients don't recognize that they're carrying the virus and therefore uh, don't, don't know that they're at risk of spreading it. Uh, it. This is still being studied, but it looks like the virus can incubate up to 14 days before a patient develops symptoms. On average, it's about five or six days. Uh, and the virus itself can transmit from one patient to another, uh, likely at least two days prior to any symptoms actually developing. Uh, which further contributes to viral spread because, again, patients are walking around carrying this virus and not realizing that they might be transmitting it through droplets coming out of their mouth as they speak or, or cough uh, or even just breathing. Uh, the widespread uh, effects of this virus were also complicated by the fact that uh, there was very slow responses uh, in countries all around the world in terms of developing effective testing to determine who's actually sick and carrying the virus, uh, as well as uh, lack systems for tracing contacts of people who are sick and, and getting them to be isolated to prevent them from infecting other people. Uh, so just as a snapshot, as of June 10th, uh, as we know, this virus has spread all across the globe. There were over 7.2 million confirmed cases uh, and more than 413,000 people have died from this infection. Um, the rate of death of, versus those patients who have been known tested positive is about 5.6%. Uh, in India, as of June 10th, 276,000 cases with 7,700 deaths or a death rate of 2.8%. And in the United States, there have been almost 2 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 and over 112,000 deaths uh, with a rate of 5.6% uh, death of known positive patients. However, all of this data is severely limited by the lack of testing, uh, particularly the fact that we know that there are asymptomatic patients who are not getting tested for the virus. So there's actually uh, certainly a lot more cases than the 7.2 million that we know about. Uh, and therefore that the, the actual death rate uh, is likely significantly lower, but we don't have accurate numbers because of the limits of testing. Uh, so how is this disease uh, uh, clinically manifested and, and how has it spread? Well, it's followed different trajectories in different countries. Uh, and this is uh, a graph showing multiple different countries and how the rates of cases uh, went up exponentially initially and in most places have begun to level out in part because of the drastic measures and lockdowns that governments have instituted uh, in addition to another, uh, a number of other measures. As we can see here, the United States the ages, very, we had very poor testing, particularly in certain regions of the United States, uh, where cases were spreading and patients were not getting uh, tested, uh, and uh, the virus continued to spread uh, to the point where uh, hospital systems in some places like New York City were almost overrun with too many patients. Uh, in India, they appear to have locked down a little bit earlier, uh, and caused the, the rate of cases to go up at a little bit slower and more manageable pace, uh, although cases continue to rise uh, over time. 
So why do governments lock down? It was because of this fast rising number of cases uh, and the number of severe cases that required uh, health care in the hospital and perhaps of patients being placed on ventilators to try and prevent them from succumbing to the disease. And basically, if no uh, mitigation measures were taken, it would be estimated that the virus would spread so quickly that healthcare systems would soon be overwhelmed and not be able to care for patients that they otherwise might be able to treat. And so the goals of governments locking down and asking patients to stay home, asking patients to wear masks, asking patients uh, to stay away, or asking people to stay away from other people was to prevent, was to slow down the spread of this virus. It was never to make the virus go away. It was to prevent the cases from rising so quickly and, and, uh, and flatten the curve of the transmission of the virus and spread it out over time so that doctors and healthcare systems would be able to handle the number of patients that were arriving with respiratory distress who needed their care. Uh, the way different governments responded and the way uh, populations uh, bought into those responses have certainly affected how, that ha how the flattening of the curve has, has transpired in different ways in different countries. And I'm gonna highlight just a few countries uh, that show some of the extremes of how uh, responses were handled. For example, in Italy, which showed a high number of infections very early on in the pandemic, uh, the, the idea of socially distancing and pe people staying at home and staying away from each other to limit the spread was not well accepted early on. And the number of cases exploded uh, and they, they indeed reached the point where their hospitals were overrun and did, the doctors had to make choices about which patients they were going to admit to the hospital and continue to treat, uh, which was a very difficult situation. Uh, and then eventually the government instituted very drastic lockdown measures, some of the most uh, drastic in the world, and people did stay home. And you can see that after a rapid rise in cases, Italy did manage to completely flatten their curve uh, and has very few uh, additional cases developing now. Taiwan, alternatively, uh, had a very early and effective response. In fact, they had a pandemic response system in place before this uh, pandemic even started, and they recognized it very early, closing ports to cruise ships, screening uh, passengers coming in through airports beginning in January, uh, in, in addition to uh, social distancing measures. And with that, they actually had very few cases develop and a very flat uh, infection rate early on. Uh, a couple of other examples are the approach taken in Sweden where the government made the conscious decision to not fully lock down the society and instead recommended that high-risk patients such as older patients or patients with underlying illness uh, might be better off staying home, but that other people could carefully go out and, and just be respectful of each other, uh, but mostly live their normal lives. Unfortunately, this led to a much greater caseload than other comparable countries, with 4,700 deaths by June 10th, uh, in a relatively small sized country of 10 million people. Uh, and if you compare that to their neighbor, Finland, which is a similar country who, uh, that did institute strict lockdowns from the beginning, they had less than one tenth the number of deaths uh, as compared to Sweden, showing that locking down and asking people to stay home actually does make a, an important difference in terms of preventing people from dying and overwhelming healthcare systems. So this just reiterates this whole idea of slowing down the spread of the virus based on its incubation period uh, and how long people are infectious. Uh, so if we understand that the, the spread of the virus, its reproduction is based on its transmission, uh, the, the, the inherent transmission properties are hard to control. But the contact and exposure rate is something that we can control, as we just talked about with social distancing, strict hand washing, wearing of masks, quarantining sick patients. These are all things that are slowing the spread of the virus uh, versus alternatively reducing the duration of infectiousness uh, by developing new treatments. 
But in terms of contract uh, exposure and rates, I just want to say one more thing on, the, on this end. I'll give the example of my own institution, the University of Pennsylvania Health System. Uh, this is a curve showing the actual number of patients uh, admitted to our hospital system uh, throughout the entire course of the pandemic. Uh, when we first shut down our, our hospital in, in the middle of March, uh, through now, we can see there was a rapid rise in cases, and then eventually we were able to flatten our curve and start to show a decline in cases. How did this happen? Well, when the, we saw that the virus was coming and starting to reach our region, the hospitals and clinics closed. Um, and to all non-urgent, non-COVID patients in order to make more room in the hospital for those patients who would be coming in, uh, with positive COVID testing. Uh, however, our, the efforts were limited because we had limited ability to test patients. So some patients coming in sick who we suspected might have COVID never formally got tested because there simply wasn't enough testing. We, we were only testing patients who were sick enough that we thought they might end up in the hospital. But we also had staff wearing personal protective equipment, masks, gowns, uh, and other things to try and prevent them from getting infected, but we were not masking the patients themselves who could still be potentially putting out virus through uh, particles in their breath. Uh, after several weeks, universal masking was initiated where all patients were asked to place masks on their face in addition to the healthcare workers. Uh, and what we saw was a drastic change. So. Early on in the pandemic, over the first few weeks, 1.6% of our healthcare workers ended up getting infected uh, by a source that could be traced back to specifically caring for a patient with uh, the COVID infection. However, since the time that is universal masking has been initiated, we've had exactly zero healthcare workers in our system get infected by caring for a sick patient. So the simple act of putting a mask on both parties, and the mask is really to prevent you from spreading it to the other person, not to protect you from getting it from, to getting it yourself. But that simple act drastically reduced the rate of spread. Uh, with that, we turned the curve and we slowed down the spread of this infection and cases started to come down, at which point we reopened our hospitals for elective surgeries and non-urgent clinic patients. Uh, have been slowly increasing those non-urgent, non-COVID patient volumes over time. Uh, so that's one way to slow the spread. Another way is to reduce the duration of the uh, infectiousness of the virus itself. And to do that, we can identify treatments that slow the spread of the virus. Uh, that can be done by repurposing old drugs or potentially generating new drugs. So, how do we ident identify new treatments? Well, there have been multiple sites around the world, scientists coming together to do high throughput screening of uh, prior known drugs, drugs used for other purposes to see if they would be effective in treating COVID-19. An example of this is remdesivir that was originally developed for the Ebola uh, virus. Uh, and that has shown some, some ability to slow the spread or reduce the severity of COVID-19. Uh, in fact, one study showed that it decreased the time to recovery from 15 days down to 11 days. Uh, so it's not a cure. It doesn't stop the disease, but it does help limit its spread because patients are not sick for as long. Uh, another way, thing we can do is we can extrapolate data for, on the biology and treatments of other viruses and other coronaviruses uh, we can rep replicate models of viral infections, we can do molecular modeling, and we can examine effects of potential therapies in animal models of coronavirus infection. So I'm going to turn just for a few minutes uh, to my own work on a disease called optic neuritis, which is an inflammation of the optic nerve that can occur idiopathically or can occur in the systemic central nervous system disease, multiple sclerosis. Optic neuritis presents with acute vision loss in one eye that progresses for one to two weeks, accompanied by pain. Oops. 
going too fast here. Most patients with optic neuritis, their vision recovers. 95% of patients recover most of their vision, but not all of their vision. We can give them steroids to help their vision get better faster, but it doesn't ultimately help their final visual outcome. So there's no really effective uh, treatment to prevent the permanent vision loss that actually occurs in up to 60% of these patients. They do not fully recover. Uh, in addition to inflammation and myelin damage, there is significant neuronal damage to the retinal ganglion cells, the, the nerves that make up the op, the nerve cells that make up the optic nerve. We can measure this in human patients using a test called OCT to measure the thickness of the nerve and thinning of the nerve correlates with vision loss. So in this disease, optic neuritis, there's acute vision loss from inflammation and demyelination that improves when the inflammation resolves. And then there's permanent vision loss from the death of the nerve cells or retinal ganglion cells. So my lab is trying to prevent the permanent vision loss from optic neuritis. And we think we'll be able to do that if we can find treatments that stop the neuronal cell death. If it works for optic neuritis, it might work for other MS lesions or other optic nerve diseases. And the methods we use are animal models of optic neuritis to try and identify drugs that prevent retinal ganglion cell loss. The most common uh, animal model of multiple sclerosis is experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, which is an autoimmune model where if you immunize an animal with a myelin antigen, you get an immune response that causes inflammation in the central nervous system. But there are also viral-induced demyelinating disease models, including the neurovirulent strains of the mouse hepatitis virus, which is a beta coronavirus like SARS-CoV-2, that can induce inflammation and demyelination in mice following intracranial inoculation, which I will touch briefly on and you will hear much more about from Dr. Desharmo. So my group has shown that optic neuritis occurs in these multiple sclerosis animal models. In the EAE model, we can see inflammation in the optic nerve, loss of myelin, axon damage, and loss of retinal ganglion cells that all correlate with a progressive loss of visual function. And in the viral-induced, the coronavirus-induced experimental optic neuritis model, we see similar inflammation of the optic nerve, with decreased myelin and a loss of retinal ganglion cells and their axons. We can use this model to study features of coronaviruses, such as their ability to be transported along axons. The optic nerve is, is an excellent tool because it's an isolated white matter tract where, that we can visualize viral pathology within easily. And here showing a neurovirulent strain of mouse hepatitis virus that's fluorescently tagged versus a control strain that is not neurovirulent. There's no spread of the virus here. We can see fluorescent virus antigen in a cross section of the optic nerve as well as a longitudinal section along the axons in the optic nerve. And those, that viral antigen over the course of several days travels all the way into the eye, into the retinal ganglion cell bodies in the retina uh, within the eye. We can use these models to look for new treatments. Uh, my lab has looked at treatments that activate a deacetylase called CERT1 that's involved in deacetylating numerous protein targets throughout the cell. Uh, and uh, so some CERT1 activators have been shown to prevent uh, degeneration of nerve cells in a number of animal models. And we showed that CERT1 activators can prevent retinal ganglion cell loss in the EAE optic neuritis model as well as the MHV coronavirus-induced experimental optic neuritis, where retinal ganglion cell loss, as well as degeneration of their axons, is prevented by CERT1 activating drugs. And this uh, protection is prevented if we give a CERT1 inhibitor. The CERT1 inhibitors work by reducing oxidative stress, so reactive oxygen species that build up in the optic nerve are blocked by CERT1 inhibitors, uh, CERT1 activators, uh, and they it does this by promoting a mitochondrial coenzyme PGC1 alpha that promotes mitochondrial biogenesis as shown here uh, by increased levels of mitochondrial enzymes. So that's, a, that's how we use animal models to look at uh, potential treatments for a coronavirus. But is this optic neuritis really seen in COVID-19? And I am getting close to the end here, so stick with me. I'm going to turn to neurologic effects of COVID-19. 
We've actually not seen an increase in optic neuritis related to COVID-19. There was one center in the United States that had noticed a number of optic neuritis cases early on, uh, but the rest of the neuro-ophthalmology community has not seen these cases, uh, and there's, there's no indication that it's really causing optic neuritis. However, COVID-19 does cause another a number of other neurologic manifestations, including headaches, dizziness, uh, strokes and seizures, perhaps due to uh, inflammation of, of the blood vessels, uh, as well as this peculiar symptom of loss of smell that has been noticed in a high percentage of COVID-19 patients. In fact, in this one study, uh, prospective study, almost 80% of patients had a loss of smell, and 11% of them lost their smell prior to the onset of their other COVID-19 symptoms. So it could be a harbinger of oncoming disease. Um, and then I'd like to finish with one case showing another form of neurologic complication of COVID-19. This is a case we saw at the University of Pennsylvania of a 14-year-old girl who complained of fevers, chills, sore throat, and chest tightness in early February before COVID-19 was really on her radar. Her family had similar symptoms and they were tested for the influenza virus, which was negative. Uh, the, the patient got better after the course of several days. And then about a month later, she developed a new onset of fevers and chills. She again had a negative influenza test. And by now the SARS-CoV-2 virus was in the area and that was tested for by a PCR test and she tested negative. One week later, her symptoms continued to worsen and she went into severe acute respiratory distress and needed to be intubated and placed on a ventilator. She had a repeat SARS-CoV-2 viral PCR antibody test, oh, sorry, viral antigen test, which was negative again. She was treated empirically with the antibiotics for an unknown cause uh, and did improve somewhat and was taken off the ventilator one week later. As soon as she could speak when the, when the ventilator was removed, the patient began complaining of double vision. What we found on her exam was that her vision in each eye was normal at 20-20, but she had an abduction deficit in her right eye. So when she looked to her right side, her right eye could not move over. And she had bilateral swelling of her optic nerves in the back of her eye. Uh, she had underwent an MRI scan, which showed extra fluid surrounding the optic nerve and flattening of the back part of the eye, along with uh, stenosis of the transverse sinus in the brain, all signs suggesting high pressure within the brain. And this was confirmed by a lumbar puncture, uh, which also showed that she had extra protein within her cerebral spinal fluid, suggesting an inflammatory process. So her neurologic diagnoses were a right sixth nerve palsy, that was the inability to move her eye to the right, uh, and the papal edema, or swelling of the optic nerves due to increased intracranial pressure. Uh, of note, she, un she then underwent a SARS-CoV-2 antibody test after having tested negative for the viral antigen multiple times. And her antibody test was positive, suggesting that she had indeed at some point had COVID-19. Uh, and she ultimately was diagnosed with a Kawasaki-like disease. Kawasaki disease is a multi-system inflammatory disorder often seen in children after a viral illness. And we are seeing an increasing number of these cases uh, in, um, in the COVID-19 pandemic, including ones like this that have neurologic complications. So in conclusion, the mitigation strategies, the lockdowns, the wearing of masks are all things that are indeed slowing the spread of COVID-19. So thank you all for your efforts in doing that. Studying coronaviruses such as mouse hepatitis, coronavi mouse hepatitis virus may facilitate better understanding of viral properties and provide strategies to explore new therapies that we're about to hear more about. Uh, and COVID-19, in addition to the respiratory disease, causes a number of other symptoms, including a variety of neurologic manifestations. So I'd like to thank the people in my lab and my collaborator, Dr. Desharma, who's about to speak. And thank you all for your, uh, for your kind invitation today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Schindler, for your enlightening presentation. The audience may not know that it's midnight there at Philadelphia right now. And Dr. Schindler has taken all the trouble to arrange for a lecture with us at this time of the day. 
in spite of his busy schedule as a clinician and also as a professor. We really appreciate that, Dr. Schindler. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Schindler has basically explained to us the clinical aspects of coronavirus infection, and he has compared responses in different countries and also spoke us about the neurological compl complications with relation to COVID-19 infection. So can we now ask the participants for their questions? Do we have any questions from the participants? Okay, we have a question from Tirthankar Dalui to everyone. His question is, can the virus be transmitted through reverse zoonosis? Through reverse zoonosis, so back to animals from humans? I don't think we have an answer to that yet. It doesn't appear to be. I mean, there's been some scattered reports that dogs have been infect, infected and some other animals. How it got to them, we don't know. Uh, but those are definitely things that still need to be looked at. Okay, that might have answered the question. Okay, I have a second question from Shailaza Tiwari. Uh, her question is, why some patients in China experience change of skin color to dark after recovery? COVID-19, but eventually died. Why is it not reported in any other parts of the world? Um, yeah, you know, there's a number of things reported in China that we're not necessarily seeing in other parts of the world. And I don't, again, I don't think we know the answers and everything's still being, still being looked at. But I think one of the answers to that question is that we're definitely some changes or mutations in the virus and the strain of the virus. Um, the virus that spread so rapidly through Europe and most of the United States um, has some mutations as compared to the original virus isolated in the labs in Wuhan, China. And perhaps that explains some of the differences in the clinical responses that we're seeing. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shindler. I have a question. Can COVID-19 recur after recovery? I don't Can know. The infection <laughs> oh. there's, there's, there's been reports of people testing, po testing positive, then recovering, testing negative, and then testing positive again. I think most of those cases are just that there's still some residual viral antigen within the body that's coming to the surface or coming out of cells and then showing up in the testing. Uh, not necessarily that they're sick again from a new infection. But then again, there is also this inflammatory response, particularly in the children, that seems to be more of an immune response and not a new infection. Um, okay. So we still don't know, but most likely people are immune after their first infection. Dr. Roli Khan has a question. First of all, I would like to thank the speaker for his excellent lecture. I have a very simple question. From his lecture, I came to know use of mask is very essential. There are different types of masks in the market. Which is which? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. The really, the, the purpose of the mask is to prevent the droplets from your own mouth getting out into space and infecting other people. So really pretty much anything you can put over your face is going to be at least somewhat effective. If it's too porous, um, you know, a crochet mask is not going to be great because it's got a lot of holes in it. But any kind of cotton cloth, it doesn't have to be a surgical mask. A surgical mask. You can wear a bandana. You can wear a scarf. All of those things will be highly effective at preventing you from spreading virus unknowingly to somebody else. If you're I have one question. I am Dr. Firdausi. I am one question from Bangladesh. Sure. Okay, Dr. Firdausi, please put in your question. Um, my question is, uh, the some countries are already announced that they are virus free now, like Vietnam and New Zealand. They already opened and some uh, part of this Spain. So, is it? Uh, any possible to combat that by virus again of those countries? Is it, is it possible that they're going to get infected again? Or I guess I'm not sure what you're asking, but yes, there, there are many countries who have slowed their rates of infection or even regions within countries 
that have slowed the rate of infection where we're not seeing the virus circulating. But in most parts of the world, there is still virus circulating. And I think even those places where they're not detecting any right now, just because of the facts of the world and there's so much global travel, it's likely that some is going to come back. But it's probably not gonna be as overwhelming uh, and, and as dangerous as the situation got in Italy, for example, because people are being more cognizant. If, so, if at least some of the people are wearing masks and some people are keeping their distance from other people, then we can slow the spread enough that the healthcare systems won't get overrun, even if there is a second wave or second generation of infections within those countries that appear to have cleared it. I have another I question. Yes. The question. Please, uh, Dr. Firdosi Begum, please, uh, uh, please put in your question. Yes, we are now one okay, understanding yeah. that people, and our people as now has understanding that the, um, it will be hard immunity can protect the, uh, the person uh, from the attack, the, what uh, the hard immunity, how long it can take to grow that hard immunity? How long does it take to develop the immunity? Yes, we don't hard know. immunity. The people are saying nowadays, who has the hard, hard immunity? Yes. H-E-R-D, I think. Yeah, H-E-R-D, hard immunity. He can, he or she can survive. It is a survival of the fetus like theory. So. Uh, what about your idea about this? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, again, there's so much that we don't know about this disease and this, this virus, but, you know, we can extrapolate from what we know about other things. There are probably people who have been exposed to other pathogens and already have some level of immunity to this particular virus due to cross-reactivity that we don't recognize. So there are some people who are probably just naturally immune. And then there are some people who probably have been exposed to this virus and have now developed their own immunity. We don't know if that's gonna last. We don't know if they'll, they'll keep that immunity or if it will fade over time. And we don't even know if it's mediated by the antibodies that they're developing or if it's by T cell immune responses uh, or other things. So as, as much as scientists around the world are racing to study this, there's, there's so much more to be learned um, that will probably be coming out over the, the coming months and even years after this pandem pandemic has faded uh, from the public's consciousness. Thank you so much. Thank you. In, in, um, Thank you, Doctor. Uh, can you put in your questions in the email? We shall. We can't. We cannot entertain any more questions due to shortage of time. So I request all participants to put in your question in the chat box. We shall email it to the speakers, and we shall again get you back with the answers. Okay, is that fine? Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Schindler. Thank you, thank you. so much for delivering uh, this wonderful, wonderful speech to us. And at this time of the day, especially, thank you very much. It was an honor interacting with you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. It was an honor being here. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Jayasri Das Sharma. Dr. Sharma did her PhD from the Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, Kolkata, in collaboration with Indian Statistical Institute. She, did, she then did her extensive postdoctoral work at the University of Pennsylvania, and then successively joined the neurology department of Thomas Jefferson University as an assistant professor. Currently, she is serving the Department of Biological Sciences of Isar Kolkata as a professor. Dr. Sharma has several accolades to her credits, and among them, it is worth to mention that she has several awards, like the Professorship Award, the Undergraduate Teaching Award from the American Society of Microbiology, and the IUSSTF Award. Dr. Sharma has spent considerable time studying the coronaviruses, focusing on the key mechanisms underlying beta coronavirus infection, viral spread, host immune responses, and related pathogenesis. She primarily focuses on the molecular mechanisms of initiation of infection mediated by a key protein called the spike glycoprotein. Today, she will discuss with us the role of this spike protein in coronavirus pathogenesis. Dr. Sharma? Dr. Sharma? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, thank, thank you, you Dr. Sharma. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Nilakshi. And uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers for giving us an opportunity to uh, give, to tell about our work. And also in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, when the whole world is in tented hook, uh, I think this type of discussion keeps everybody like, you know, aware of the, what is going on. And as Ken gave a wonderful lecture about the overall what is going on. So I will try to take that forward from there. And can I share my uh, screen now? And thank you, uh, Dr. Papia, um, for inviting us. Thank yeah, you. I'm hearing about you, but it's good to see you. Thank you. Shall I uh, share my screen? Are you sure, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, sure. Can you, can you see that? No, it's not been shared yet. I shared already. Share, okay. Share screen. Right. It's, it's, it's coming up. Now it is there, no? Yeah, it's, 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 it's there. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, so just to first tell you that um, the work I'm going to talk about, that is mainly what I was doing with my, group, with my uh, group of students and my collaborators about that uh, corollary between the uh, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, fellow beta coronavirus mouse cov And I will tell you why it is so. So when I will go through that, first thing I want to tell you, as Ken already talked about um, these clinical aspects, so you all know that SARS-CoV-2 is infecting the lungs and they're infecting by binding to a receptor called ACE2. And this mm -hmm. is um, shared by um, uh, 18 years back, the SARS-CoV came. And uh, this you can see here, this uh, spike protein, which is protruded from the virus is attaching to the host receptor. So taking forward, uh, to first to tell you that SARS-CoV-2, uh, if we think about what is going on when the virus, how the virus is infected. So as a first step, it has to enter to the cells. So as I mentioned to you that there is a ACE2 is the receptor, which is an enzyme 2. And there is another enzyme which is called TMPRSS2 because by blocking this TMPRSS2 and ACE2, people have chosen, proven that that can stop the SARS-CoV-2 infection partially, but not fully. So why it is so? So you can see here, that this is SARS-CoV which came 18 years back and this is the new novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. They both use this ACE2 as a receptor and they both showed that TMPRSS2 can also block their activity. And there are neutralization antibodies raised against SARS-CoV, which work very well against SARS-CoV, but it is not working in SARS-CoV-2 or partially working. So why it is so? So that's the question started in the mind, like how the virus is active. So as I told you from the beginning, and the cane also mentioned several times that the spike protein is a host attachment protein. This protein binds to the receptor and we will talk about the spike protein because uh, the common thing for any viral infection that first is its entry to the cell, its fusion and its replication. But our work is mainly focused on spike protein and I will try to tell you what we learned for several decades of work from murine coronavirus and how it can be translated to the SARS-CoV-2. So this is the structural protein. You can see the envelope protein, membrane protein, nucleocapsid protein, and lipid bilayer, how they are arranged. And this spike protein gives a crown-like structure. That's what the name came as coronavirus. And it belongs to the genus beta coronavirus. So as the focus will be spike protein, so first let me tell you what are the organization of the functional domains. Spike protein helps in binding, entry, fusion, virus to host fusion, and cell to cell fusion. So if most of the coronaviruses are divided into S1 and S2 subunit, because there is a cleavage site, some of the coronavirus spike protein cleaves, some of them may not cleave. And in the S1 domain, 
there is a signal peptide, then there is a N terminal domain, and there is a C terminal domain. And in some cases, N terminal domain is the receptor binding, and in some cases, C terminal RBD domain is the receptor binding. You can see here in this the receptor binding, and this receptor binding is also possesses some antigenicity. So people generally try to raise antibodies or vaccines against S1 domain. An S1 domain is highly variable. That's what you will see how the different human coronaviruses uh, attack different receptors. Whereas in S2 domain, you can see there is a fusion peptide. Next to that is a heptad repeat one, and there is a heptad repeat two, and transmembrane domain. And in different coronaviruses, the fusion protein comes as a different level, like fusion protein 1 to 4, which Dr. Devnath Pal will discuss in detail. But uh, here we have to focus on that, that this uh, fusion peptide with HR1 and HR2, they form the fusion code. And when S1 subunit is very important for receptor binding, S2 domain is important for after receptor binding for virus to host cell fusion as well as cell to cell fusion. So that's what the S1, S2 domain, when there is a cleavage after that conformational changes happen and then S2 domain get exposed and this S2 domain with the complicated machinery works to cause the fusion. And heptadipine domain actually forms a homotrimeric assembly and they form six helix bundle. So that's what they are responsible for fusion and entry, which will be part of the focus of my talk. So if I show you a cartoon diagram, this is the receptor binding domain, which attaches to the host cells. Then there is the fusion peptide, which is attached to the HR1, and then there it is attached to the HR2, and there is the transmembrane domain and carboxy terminal tail. So these things together gives the spike protein the functionality of to bind entry, initiation, and as well as for fusion. So if I tell you what is happening into the human body, so you can see this is the SARS-CoV-2. It is coming most likely, you know, people are thinking that it is coming through droplets and uh, then it enters through the nose and it actually replicates in the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract here. And then it attacks the cells, epithelial cells, in the lung. And what, what will happen when it enters to the um, cell? So you can see that there is the ACE2 receptor, which is present in the lung cell. And then the virus is coming, spike protein is attaching, there is the fusion. Then it gets uncoated. And then there is the RDRP, which is RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, that gets translated by prime to three prime. And then they don't, virus doesn't come with any other protein here, but from this, they make the replication of the subgenomic mRNA, like spike, then non structural protein, enveloped protein, membrane protein, and nucleocapsid protein. And when they come into the endoplasmic reticulum, they assemble when the E, M, and S assemble first, then nucleocapsid just get assembled and they are packaged, and then they go by exocytosis they release, the virus releases and attack another cell. So that is the life cycle of any coronavirus and it is true for SARS-CoV-2 also. So now, if I think about it, what is happening in the um, like inflammatory cycle? Because you know, inflammatory response, how the virus, our host is responding and what is going on? So you know, there is a protective versus pathogenic inflammatory response happens. That's what we see some people are dying and some people survive. So what are these cycles? So in pathogenic cycle, there is a dysregulated inflammation. There is a robust viral replication which causes delayed interferon response. And there is the inflammatory monocyte macrophage and neutrophil infiltrates into the site of viral replication where virus load is there. There is a pro-inflammatory cytokine and chemokines which tries to actually set the stage so that the virus can be cleared as they help to migrate the peripheral cells. And 
in pro-inflammatory cell cytokines when it's huge and virus is getting cleared, then anti-inflammatory response comes and brings back the homeostasis. So what is happening? There is the enhanced epithelial and endothelial cell apoptosis happens as a consequence. There is an increased vascular leakage and suboptimal T cell and antibody response and impaired viral clearance. These things, if it is happening, then there is a alveolar uh, like infiltrates and there is a ARDS, acute respiratory distress and death is the outcome. Whereas when the non-robust viral replication is there, virus cannot replicate that much because there is an early interferon response and then inflammatory monocyte macrophage and neutrophil infiltrates due to the gradient of the pro-inflammatory cytokine and chemokines. And then there is a minimal epithelial and endothelial cell apoptosis, reduced vascular leakage, and there is a optimal T cell and antibody response, effective viral clearance, which gives protective immunity and host survival. So now the thing is, you can see as we all are discussing about some people are dying, there is a comorbidity, there are like age dependent death, the older people are dying more, younger people are getting cured. So because there is a different type of protect pathogenic versus protective regulated inflammation. And two things are very common in any beta coronaviruses, the cytokine storm or cytokine release syndrome, as you can see, they need to be up to bring the inflammatory cells into the site of in infection. But there should be anti-inflammatory responses which should bring back to the homeostasis. And for that, they need the help from the T-cell which is impaired in cases of death. That's what this is the thing going on in the SARS-CoV-2 versus SARS-CoV and people are dying or people are living. So now the thing is, what are the challenges? If we know already this much, why there is a challenge? Because 18 years back, SARS came and we were able to combat with the SARS and that didn't damage that much, didn't become pandemic also. Why SARS-CoV-2 is a pandemic and is a threat today? Because human to human transmission is very high. There is a cross species transmission is there and highly in, the virus is highly infectious and lethal in nature. And more uh, importantly, it requires a B, it is a BSL-3 pathogen. So not much studies are done except the hospital-based study. And whatever study we have, we are trying to make a corollary between SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, as well as beta coronavirus mouse CoV. So here there is a problem that the pathophysiologic information is only available based on mainly hospitalized patient data, as I mentioned. So what we know and what we need to know. So right now, our requirement is to address the pan-COVID situation that demands the development of effective broad-spectrum therapeutics because uh, there are already more than 12 strains are, uh, there, even in China, India, people are finding new strains, some mutations. So making a um, antiviral is a challenge because we need a broad spectrum therapeutics. And there, uh, Dr. Devnath Pal will talk a little bit more about fusion peptide. And I will show you how the fusion peptide can be a broad spectrum therapeutics if possible, because um, we have some uh, experimental data in mouse model. So now if I combine these two, what is the need of the hour? So we need a broad spectrum of pan antiviral, an experimental animal model, mouse, and also a non-human primate model to understand the pathogenesis. So with that uh, aspect, uh, I would like to shed some light that um, there are murine beta coronavirus and there are human beta coronavirus, which shares lots of sequence similarity as well as their domains are same in structural uh, spike protein with some like um, genome differences. So to tell you the truth, the mouse COVID, which is studied for last several decades because it is a BSL-2 pathogen and it only infects mouse. It doesn't infect much human and it varies from a vertebrate host and it uses a receptor which is CKM1, carcio embryonic 
antigen related cell adhesion molecule. And you can see here in the left panel, MHV1 causes respiratory disease, MHV2 causes hepatitis, MHV3 causes uh, ependymitis, meningitis, MHV JHM is lethal and causing neurotropic diseases. Whereas MHV A59 is a unique strain which I will talk about that hepatoneurotropic and it causes hepatitis, meningitis, encephalitis, and chronic stage demyelination and concurrent axonal loss, as already Ken introduced about the demyelination and optic neuritis. And you can see all of them either uses receptor to enter or they can go directly by endocytosis. Whereas in HCoV, the SARS uses SE2, SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, whereas MERS uses DPP4 and NL63 also uses SE2, 229 uses aminopeptidase and OC43 and HKE1 uses NO acetyl methylation. So these things together, tells us that they vary from like the choosing their receptor. And that's what most of the human viruses, except SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2 and MARS, they target the lung cells and they cause the severe respiratory syndrome with alveolar damage. And that's what it is called severe acute respiratory syndrome virus. Whereas other human viruses, they only causes mild cold. So that is the overview of this. And if we now tell you about the disease kinetics, what we gathered for SARS-CoV-2 from the human patient data, and if we compare with our mouse model, so first I want to show you the SARS-CoV-2 data. You can see here the viral allele goes up for like, you know, from four to 14 days it can stay. But after that, it goes down, infectious virus. Viral RNA also goes down, but retains to a certain extent. Whereas there is a diffuse alveolar lung damage. And this, during that damage, there is a cytokine release syndrome because pro-inflammatory cytokines are very high. All sorts of pro-inflammatory cytokines people have reported from the patient data. And they cannot bring back the anti-inflammatory in most of the cases because renin angiotensin system is very much important. It is called RSA system. So for renin angiotensin system, which helps the anti-inflammatory to get upregulated, they need the ACE2, where virus blocks ACE2, so they cannot use the ACE2. And that pathway, it cannot work so that they cannot convert the, um, the enzymes to 1 to 7 angiotensin. And that's what it is also a comorbidity of several people like hypertension, then uh, diabetes who are using SCE inhibitors. If I go back to our mouse model, which I will discuss, you can see here viral RNA goes uh, by day 5 to day 6. It is highest, reaches its peak. Then the infectious virus also reaches its peak. And then after day 10, we don't see much of the infectious virus. Uh, neither we see a little bit of viral RNA is there. And it starts the demyelination. demyelination. If we see the corollary between SARS-CoV and MCOV, we were seeing that there are quite similar disease kinetics. So that is telling us that we should go back to our um, mouse model and try to understand. So mouse model, to tell you that mm, the first thing, which I already mentioned, that MHV A59, it causes hepatitis. You can see here, uh, this causes uh, inflammation in the liver. In acute stage, it causes meningitis. Inflammatory cells are present. It is leukocyte common antigen staining. There is a perivascular cuffing, which is a characteristics of that um, um, encephalitis. And there are microglial nodules. And Ken already talked about optic neuritis. Whereas it also causes myelitis, which is inflammation in the spinal cord. And this inflammation causes myelin sheet loss. And this myelin sheet loss 
during day 30, chronic stage gets uh, bigger and diffuse. And that time it also shows there is an axonal loss. So this is a very good model to study the human neurological disease, multiple sclerosis. So we thought, okay, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is attacking the lungs, whereas MHB attacks the nervous system. So can we see the genomic control of the pathogenic properties? So to do that, we compared the SARS-CoV and MCOV genome organization, and we have realized that there are some genomic differences which may contribute in a significant way, but we targeted the spike protein because both the spike protein is a like a glycoprotein, spike glycoprotein, and it has all the structural domains, similar domains, but there are differences in the sequence. So we compare uh, the SARS and SARS-CoV-2, that is called SARS-1 and SARS-2, and we also compared MHV-A59 with MHV-2. Why MHV-2? MHV-2 is a very closely related strain I showed you. This only causes hepatitis. And we calculated how much similarities are there in different domains and we dissected it to understand which domain may have some responsible um, responsibility for this pathogenicity and which we can translate to SARS. So here, as I mentioned, that we are comparing now the mouse A59. Now onwards, I'm showing our own studies which we did in collaboration with Dr. Kenneth Schindler. I have a long list of collaborators I will show, but Dr. Schindler is here and uh, Dr. Devnath Pal, we are working together for several years. And you can see here that MHVA59, it causes meningitis, inflammation in the meninges. It also causes encephalitis, but MHV2 only causes meningitis. It cannot enter into the brain. So if I show you what is going on, think about when a virus come to our system, what happens? How cell respond? So first thing, MHV, when it comes, CNS resident cells like microglia, astrocytes, neuron get infection. And when astrocytes and microglia, CNS resident immune cells get activated, they secrete chemokine, which I already showed you in the overall infection, that how the chemokine helps. And they help the leukocyte monocyte to migrate into the CNS. And they causes this disease. You can see that perivascular caffeine here, meningitis here, microglial nodule, which tells that these cells are responsible for clearing the virus as well as to bring the virus level down in such a way that host cell can go back to its normal state. So that's what we say after day 10, there is an amelioration of inflammatory response and that happened due to the balance of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. And due to that, virus clears, inflammation resolves, and homeostasis established in the brain. But if there is a virus persistent, then it can cause the demyelination, which um, Ken already talked about. It can also cause myelin loss in um, optic nerve as well as in the spinal cord. So now the thing is, we know these two viruses are different because one cannot enter into the brain, one can enter. So we thought, why it is so? So we started by targeted recombination. And as I think that some of the students are from biotechnology, you will be interested to know that these viruses are subgenomic mRNA. So we can target a gene and we have a system where we can exchange the gene from different strains. So in that way, we made two strains. One is RSA-59 and another one is RSA-MHV2. All the genes are same except RSA-59 spike from MHVA-59. RSA-MHV2 spike is from MHV2, which cannot enter into the brain. And we have also engineered the enhanced green fluorescence protein there. So now you can see these are the two strains, which is same except the spike protein. And interestingly, when we made these two strains and did the pathology, see, both the strain can infect the brain cells. So that is telling that spike protein is not alone is responsible for viral entry, which was not a thought when we started doing that work. Everybody thought because spike is different, that's what it is not entry. But we should know spike 
alone is not sufficient for viral entry because in both the cases, like when MHB2 spike is there, still it enters into the brain parenchyma. But the interesting thing is only DM strain, which is spike protein from DM strain, can cause demyelination. Other one cannot cause demyelination. So that's what we said that MHV protein of MHV is one of the major determinant of MHV induced demyelination and axonal loss, but not for the viral entry, which is the very much important nowadays, taking the SARS-CoV-2 as a pandemic. So now the question is why so? Why it cannot cause demyelination? Then we showed in a series of experiments, we showed that DM strain can spread from neuron to neuron and go to the spinal cord white matter. You can see this is the white matter, which is blue color. You can see the viral antigen is there because we have EGFT. This is EGFT expression. But in NDM strain, you can see it is only in the gray white matter or gray matter. It didn't go to the white matter. And it, as it didn't go to the white matter, it couldn't infect the oligodendrocytes. Here you can see there is no infection in NDM strain. But here, they infected the oligodendrocytes. Here you can see olig2 marker and surrounding that viral antigen. That is telling us that viral antigen spread to the oligodendrocytes is very important and that may be the key. So we also confirmed by immunohistochemistry that yes, in non-demyelinating strain, viral antigen retains in the gray matter only. But in, uh, in uh, demyelinating strain, it goes to the white matter where it can cause the demyelination because demyelination is a white matter loss. So now you think we wanted to see why it is so. So we took series of like frozen sections, um, uh, cryo sections, and we stained with different neuronal specific marker, tau, MAP2A, MAP2B, neurofilamin, and synaptophysin. And just to, like, this is a busy slide, but you can see here that virus releases at the nerve vein. The green is the virus and red is the neuronal marker. Here you can see it is co-localizing with neurofilament. So that means it is going through the neuron and it is releasing at the nerve vein. Here you can see synaptophysin is at the nerve vein. This is the synaptophysin marker day and green is the virus. And to confirm that, we showed that in brain you can see this DM strain can go from one neuron to another, whereas NDM strain can infect neuron but cannot spread through the neuron. And that may be one of the key that the spreading of the demyelinating strain from gray to white matter is the key for successful induction of demyelination. But then the question is why it is so? So we wanted to see, as I showed you, that at the nerve vein the virus is releasing and infecting oligodendrocytes. Then we looked at the fusogenicity. You can see DM strain, this is spreading very well and it is forming syncytia in neuronal cell. But NDM strain, even at 72 hours, they are only present in the infected cell. They didn't go from one neuron to another and didn't infect other neuron that much. Original infection is there. Same thing you can see in oligodendrocytes as oligodendrocytes forms myelin and that is mainly responsible for demyelination here. So you can see here in oligodendrocytes, demyelinating strain is infecting and forming syncytia. And NDM strain, they can infect but they cannot form syncytia. So that is telling us that fusogenicity may be one of the prerequisite for the induction or infection of the oligodendrocytes because the virus is coming through the axon releasing at the nerve and to infect. So here, our main conclusion is DMMHV infection begins in the neuronal cell body and propagates centripetally to the axon, infects oligodendrocytes in the white matter through cell-to-cell -cell fusion. Then the obvious question is why MHV2 cannot do? The uh, isogenic recombinant strain containing spike protein from MHV2 cannot do that. So we did again the sequence comparison and we came to the fusion peptide where in demyelinating strain there are two proline and in MHV2 which is non-fusogenic there is one proline. So we know proline provides rigidity in several viruses people showed that but in MHV it was never mentioned that it could be the one of the factor. So we took that insights from here 
and we started doing the isogenic recombinant strain again where we made a mutant where we deleted one proline and we studied that in vitro you can see that when there are two prolines it can fuse with time frame this is a time lapse video microscopy and here you can see that in only one proline they didn't fuse very well and we look for the viral titer there is a significant reduction of viral titer expression of the spike gene as well as nucleocapsid gene and then when we did the syncytia formation like you know we know if virus uh, causes fusion it forms syncytia you can see a nice flower like syncytia in dm strain where there is 2p but only when there is a proline is deleted the syncytia is very much reduced it took long time and cells were dissolving so then what are the pathological consequences by using this virus we did a series of studies due to time constraint i am not showing it but you can see two proline can cause demyelination there is a loss of myelin sheath but in uh, one proline didn't cause any demyelination and when there is a mild demyelination there is a inflammatory cells present but in uh, single proline not much inflammatory cells are present so that says the deletion of one proline reduce the intensity of the fusogenicity as well as consecutive demyelination and we also did the quantification and there is a significant difference so taking that as we have the collaboration with dr kenneth schindler and whenever we looked at the uh, sections in uh, spinal cord brain uh, we also do the uh, optic nerve and uh, my students are trained by dr schindler here and what uh, one of the um, student found that rsc 59 pp they can go from the like uh, uh, they are retinal layers like several retinal layers it can cross at day 3 but at day 6 it's almost throughout the retina the viral antigen but when there is a proline deletion not much viral antigen is present and that is statistically significant and further this uh, single proline mutation stop the death of the retinal ganglionic cell because here you can see when two proline is there it causes the severe retinal ganglionic cell loss because retinal ganglionic cells sustained by bnr3 whereas there is very few cells are alive whereas here you can see lots of cells are bnr3 positive so that says the deletion of one proline significantly reduce the retrograde axonal transport and retinal ganglionic cell loss so at that point dr debnath pal helped a lot are to understand how proline induce rigidity in the fusion peptide and how it can be responsible for fusogenicity in mhp so taking the molecular mo help from the molecular modeling and nms studies in combining with our in vitro and in vivo we say that yes these two in provided rigidity and responsible for fusogenicity and consecutive pathogenesis so if i combine these two studies we can say double proline based mimetic peptide may help and may have potential for antiviral therapeutics so this is the cartoon diagram where you can see that how the proline gives the rigidity debnat will discuss it in detail and it the two proline causes cell to cell fusion and it spreads from brain to spinal cord and gives the disease as i showed you in cartoon whereas when we deleted one proline there is a significant reduction of viral antigen spread from brain to the spinal cord there is a lack of de the demyelination didn't develop which is very good thing that uh, it can ha have a mimetic peptide effect and same way in retrograde axonal transport as i showed you that we inject the virus
can you hear me hello hello yes yes uh, yes talking yes ma'am i can hear you now it was yeah. all did for you yeah yes so uh, do you want me to end here now hello do you want me to do you want me to end here now or i no no yes, yes. no 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 doctor uh, doctor sharma you can continue okay okay so can you hear see the slides hello hello yes. it is yes, visible audible yeah. yeah yeah and can you see the slides yes it is visible ma'am okay okay thank you so from here actually i think i was here right yeah so we can say that result in uncontrolled viral replication and impaired delayed host immunity is related to the proline double proline when we were doing that one of the student she was also interested to see whether fusion can be stopped by using a nutraceuticals so what she did she used um, neem bark extract as you know that it is a traditional indian medicinal plant and uh, it showed her it my uh, it has uh, anti um, anti inflammatory properties and other properties too so she used that and very elegantly she showed when she is incubating the virus with the neem bark this one is reducing the cell to cell fusion and it also reducing the consecutive pathology like demyelination you can see here when she is uh, doing the spike protein attaching to the host membrane it is causing cell to cell fusion and this virus when you inject it causes demyelination but when she pre incubated the virus with the neem bark extract she is seeing reduction in the cell to cell fusion as well as there is no syncytia formation and it did not cause much demyelination so that's what we are claiming that as a director indica ameliorated ma mcov induced cell to cell fusion and consecutive inflammatory demyelination so when we are doing all this uh, from the immune part what we wanted to show as i showed you in the slide that cd4 t cell impairment may be responsible for the impaired uh, in host immunity that we also see in our mcov model you can see we use the cd4 t cell knockout mice at university of pennsylvania with dr schindler and there in summary we see that in absence of cd4 there is a much more gray matter inflammatory poliomyelitis there is a dorsal root ganglionic inflammation demyelination much much severe and there is a bulbous vacuolation in the brain and there are lots of inflammatory cells still present in the bulbous vacuolation where in control there is not much inflammatory cells present at day 30 together this thing says that cd4 t cells are important and impairment of cd4 t cell infiltration may be one of the reason for the disease severity so this one if i see what is happening so as i showed you that it is a three stage process in the disease kinetics you can see here stages of immune responses against mcov during innate immune that is actually responsible for viral replication there is a delayed interferon alpha beta response and then it goes to the provides lots of cytokine chemokines then there is a cytokine storm but there is anti inflammatory comes and then brain inflammation results but in the spinal cord if virus slowly migrate to the brain uh, spinal cord without informing the immune system they can cause chronic progressive demyelination so it is not to like you know make a make people worry about it but as sars cov2 is uh, causing the lung infection and brain stem has the respiratory control and as already ken showed that there is a there are several cases that there is optic neuritis and also other like seizure neurological symptoms so it is also very important to keep it in our mind that right now we are only dealing until 21 days when people are either recovering or dying but it might have a long term impact on the central nervous system which we that's what the patients who are coming or recovering they should be 
continuously thoroughly checked for their neurological manifestations. So now in conclusion, I can say that what we learned from the decade long studies on spike protein mediated MCOV pathogenesis. First thing I think you all agree that the spike proteins are major determinants of demyelination property and that uh, they SARS-CoV-2 and uh, MCOV. Why we are doing corollary? Because they have the similar disease kinetics. And monocyte microglial activation in MCOV tells the story of macrophage activation and its uh, initiation of the innate immune inflammation. Whereas impaired CD4 T cell migration and function may play a significant role in disease severity. Same thing we see in SARS-CoV patient that there is an impairment of CD4 T cell migration and there is a dysregulated microglial activation in some patients. But right now it is difficult to say what is going on. But now if we compare this pathology and the disease kinetics with MCOV, we can say that uh, MCOV can be a good model to give insights for SARS-CoV-2 and more specifically the two consecutive proline may provide a double protein based mimetic peptide because the fusion region is much more rigid and that is much more conserved so it may help to design a pan -CoV therapeutic targets as well as as I sh already showed you that Nimberg extract might have some potential to bind to the spike protein and restricts the viral entry for pan -CoV. and this work we are doing in collaboration with um, Sweden because we don't have BSL-3 so I think knowledge gained from MCOV studies may find the path and uh, wisdom may light the discovery of therapies against SARS-CoV-2 and pan -COVID. with that I would like to uh, introduce my entire COVID biology group because it's an effort of lots of students and lots of collaborators and um, I would like to thank all of them. You can see in the designing antivirals, Ravi is with us today. And Lucky, Abbas, they are taking the lead. And Ujjal from uh, Sweden and his group, uh, they are trying to see in, uh, whether it is also working for SARS-CoV-2. Padia, Devanjana, Mithila, Driti, and Kaushiki. They already graduated and they are still working. And uh, now um, Devnath Pal, you can see he will be also a speaker today and talk about the uh, spike protein as a therapeutic aspects and with the double protein. And Kane is also involved in structure function analysis and, um, and uh, of COVID genome. And my students who did a splendid work, Saurabh, Manmeet, and Avinay for this two JBC paper, last two JBC paper. And I have a neural cell biology, cell cell communication group, which I didn't talk much today, but they are also actively looking for the, how the host cell factors are responsible. And though my lab is COVID biology group, but very recently I started a cancer immunology group and Vaishali, Sarab, they are actively participating and Dr. Ashima Mukhopadha and Dr. Sharmila Shindukta, uh, they are my collaborator and with that I would like to thank you all but before that I should say that I have many more collaborators and many more students help whose uh, pictures I couldn't able to show here and I'm thankful to the funding bodies of Department of Biotechnology uh, for autoimmunity grant and also neuroscience grant and Council for Scientific and Industrial Research as well as System Medicine Cluster Project from DBT and as uh, ASM IUSSDA Professorship Award and Undergraduate Le uh, Teacher Award. And also I'm thankful to National Multiple Sclerosis Society for their continuous support of our research for a few years. And Dupre helped few students to go to UPenn and University of Colorado to learn few techniques. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma, for your lucid yet magnificent and detailed presentation. It was really wonderful. Thank you, thank you. I must convey to everybody that Dr. Sharma is not only a very good scientist, uh, amazing scientist, but he's also 
so she's also an amazing person a very, very humble and a very cooperative human being it was an honor to basically meet you and interact with you uh, we have already been flooded with many questions but before i can take the questions i would request all speakers and all participants to switch on your video for a group photo speakers and participants please switch on your video for a group photo Uh, being it was an honor to basically meet you and interact with you uh, we have already been flooded with many questions but before i can take the questions i would request all speakers and all participants to switch on your video for a group photo speakers and participants please switch on your video for a group photo uh, host host has to turn it on for me host it says the host has stopped the video for me milakshi i think you can switch it on for ravi uh, dr shuchi mr dr chakraborty is the host no. i can't I do that i have i I'm sorry i have transferred it to modumita modumita could you please uh, put the video on yes i think it's uh the waiting room remnants okay okay i'll try it i have many hopes yes 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 i have done that okay yeah. thank you are we ready for the picture yeah sure um, i would like my video to be on okay. you should turn it on you should turn it okay. on yeah yeah now yeah, yeah. oh, it's okay thank you thank you thank you so much okay so ready everybody <laughs> okay are we done with yeah we are done with thank you uh, thank you Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, I will obviously acknowledge all the questions. We have been, we have many questions. Uh, the first question, doc, Dr. Shongita Gongopadhyay, do blood thinning medicines like clopilet have any adverse effect in COVID-19 infection? Um, actually, there are several studies that are going on regarding this, uh, but um, right now it is difficult to um, talk about because you know. ac also will be another factor so how that blood thinning uh, will be stopped it is not easy to tell and also it differs from patient to patient that how the blood is clotting so it is not that always like you know the blood has to clot so if the patient situation understanding uh, the like um, clinical aspects is very difficult so i think uh, no one can take a call like that now okay okay i was okay our second question is from dr bishurupa ghosh uh, she says excellent presentation dr sharma please throw some light on the debate in the use of hydroxychloroquine in the in the until treatment of covid 19 infection yeah that hydroxychloroquine uh, you know it is a malarial drug and um, it work to some extent because it you know when somebody is infected um, it may work but uh, the success rate is not like that and it cannot be a like full proven uh, drug i think um, it was it didn't work in us especially and india we have to understand that we have lots of opportunistic viral infection so our immunity is completely different than uh, other countries you know so that's what you know hydrochloroquine may worked in india but it didn't work in us at all like that's what is my understanding and it's tell you the truth it's a very complicated disease as we are reading more and more it is very difficult to say because patient to patient variation matters a lot as i showed you that when the anti inflammatory and pro inflammatory conditions are balancing hydrochloroquine may adverse the situation thank you okay our third question is from dr kostov chakraborty Uh, he said nice and very lucid presentation uh, 
Dysregulated inflammation is the major cause for many dreadful disease, as you mentioned in the case of COVID-19 too. Do you think T regulatory based immune therapy can be a therapeutic approach for this disease? What is your opinion? Yeah, of course, like T regulatory cells um, should may play a role, but you know, uh, what time it will be delivered. And tell you the truth, like when people are going to the clinic, and like now there is a convulsion therapy and all these things people are talking about. So depending on when you are seeing the T regulatory cell effect, because so many cytokines and chemokines are coming, I think TGA beta is one of the part of that. As it is delayed interferon response, that is like any other COVID infection, it will be a challenge to target the T regulatory cell. But of course, T regulatory cell will have some effect if we know the sequence of the disease for individual patients. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, just one last question and we will not be able to acknowledge any more question. This question is from uh, Shupriyo Haldar. Uh, he said, extremely lucid and informative presentation. Thank you, ma'am. As this coronavirus is mutating constantly worldwide, as reported, what will be the fate of the upcoming newly developed vaccine in near future in terms of its effectiveness on people? Yeah, that's a very good question. And actually, I would love to hear that because most of the neutralizing antibodies are raised against the um, S1 domain. And as I mentioned, the receptor binding domain is the highly variable. So even SARS-CoV antibody didn't work from some of the SARS-CoV-2 patients. So it will be a challenge. In that case, you know, maybe the mimetic peptide or generating antibody against S2 domain, against the fusion peptide may have a potential. Even people already started looking for the fusion core complex because these are more conserved and they do not mutate that. But there are some mutation. So we need a pan -COV. I agree with Shukriyo that we need the pan um, like, you know, therapeutic aspect. Otherwise, virus is mutating so fast, we cannot keep it up like that. And maybe nutraceuticals like Nimbark extract, if it works like as it worked for MCOV and our preliminary data is telling, it also inhibits the replication of SARS-CoV-2. So maybe this type of product can help rather than thinking about only antibody and convulsant therapy because that may vary from patient to patient. And for convulsant therapy or vaccine, what um, we are talking about, we have to think a lot in detail because you see whose serum you are taking, if he or she may be recovered from COVID-19, but they may have other pathogen. So it is not an easy thing to decide to whom to give. Uh, I think there will be a lot more regulatory uh, affairs will be involved as we go further. Now it is a pandemic and we need to control. So we are trying whatever is possible. But with time, when our herd immunity will come, we need to think about it. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. Thank you for all your cooperation and everything that you've done. Okay, yeah. uh, there is another question. Yeah, Dr. thank you, Dr. Khan, Dr. please Sharma. put in your question. Dr. Sharma, thank you for your excellent lecture. It was in, uh, narrated in a very lucid way, in very Thanks. detailed. And I am interested in Nimbar. What is the bioactive compound which is giving the immune protection? As I came yeah. to know from your lecture. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes. Can you tell you? Can you repeat? Can you repeat the question, what, Dr. Khan? What is the bioactive compound present yeah. in neem bark which is helping to give the immunoprotection, which I came to know from your lecture? Okay. So first of all, um, the talk I gave and the work I show, um, our neem bark extract is not anti-inflammatory, rather it is antiviral. Because we pre-incubated the virus with the neem bark extract and we uh, allowed the virus not to enter even. So that's what it is not immunotherapy, um, like it is not anti-inflammatory, rather it is antiviral. And the bioactive compound, if you ask me, we already started looking for it. And there are some uh, compounds which are like limonoid, terpenoid, this type of compounds will have effect, we are hoping. But we are in the stage of isolating that and testing in our system. So we started with the whole Nimberg extract. 
instead of going for deductionist model because you know if we go for deductionist model to a compound in most cases it doesn't work very well so that's what we started with the holistic way from the compound now we are isolating and as our system is ready we may find the active compound and most likely um, that terpenoid and limonoid type will be bioactive thank you madam thank you a lot okay thank you we cannot take any more questions mm. okay more questions mm. okay uh, i will take this opportunity to introduce our next speaker uh, our next speaker is dr ravi mahalingam he is a professor of neurology at the university of colorado school of medicine he is also a visiting professor at the sri ramachandra medical college and research institute chennai he completed his phd in biochemistry and molecular biology from southern go. illinois university to usa to for the past 3 decades dr mahalingam has been working on the pathogenesis latency and reactivation of human varicella zoster virus he established the unique animal model using simian varicella virus infection in non human primates today he will discuss the results of pathogenesis studies using non human primate models in covid 19 sars cov and mars uh, dr mahalingam can i share my screen yeah if yeah, please yeah yes sir you can yeah are you able to see yeah yeah yes, yes. okay so thank you very much for that introduction and i really appreciate uh, the invitation and um, i have uh, participated in other meetings with uh, dr jayshree das sharma has organized and i have always learned a lot every time i had uh, visited and one of these days i hope to really be there physically to see you all and uh, really learn a lot and this is extremely informative so uh, today i'm going to tell you the following uh, i have to be honest that i am not a coronavirologist i work with uh, human varicella zoster virus and uh, i i work with the the primate model non human primate model which is a simian varicella virus so initially i'm just going to Uh, tell you take a few minutes to explain to you the background why i'm talking about non human primates what my experience has been and then uh, review the current literature status on sars mers and covid in non human primate model in covid 19 the primate model is just barely developing so it's a great idea now to sort of get a feel for what it entails the primate model to develop and finally i'll finish up with a proposal which uh, dr desh jeshri das sharma is leading to really study the covid 19 using various experiences that we have gained as a team so initially just bear with me i just give you an idea of what my experiences in developing a primate model most of the people as you know you know we get chicken pox as children the virus enters through the uh, orofacial route it establishes uh, an infection in the tonsils enters the the lung and the bronchoalveolar area and it spreads to the rest of the body and it establishes a latent infection lifelong latent infection in the dorsal root ganglion and decades later it reactivates to produce shingles which is a disease of the elderly but sometimes young people can also get shingles now most of us we get shingles and it goes away and uh, we recover well there is a small percentage of patients who have you know depending on their immune status and their age they have a condition called post herpetic neuralgia where the area where they had pain it is so intense this is a picture drawn by an artist who had post herpetic neuralgia that pain is quite intense so that is a condition that everybody wants to make sure we understand now it turns out that t cell immunity against the virus is 
for us to prevent virus reactivation. Not only that, just like what we are seeing in COVID, this varicella virus, after establishing latency and reactivating, it causes a multi-organ disease. When the virus reactivates, in addition to post herpetic neuralgia, you can see vasculopathy, stroke, giant cell arthritis, myelopathy, meningoencephalitis, cerebellitis, and the central nervous palsies, ocular disorders, and even cardiovascular and pulmonary disease. And one thing that sort of uh, left out here is uh, uh, intestinal obstruction. So this causes a multi-organ disease, and all of this can happen in the absence of skin rash. Now, for a long time, we have been trying to develop an animal model, and we found out that you know, more than one animal model has been tried, Skid Hue mouse, which is severely immunocompromised mouse model, where you engraft human tissues under the kidneys capsule of this immunosuppressed mouse and inoculate with the virus. What we found out in that situation is primary infection happens, there is innate immune response and very limited transcription. That's, that's, that's where the model is right now. Other labs have tried hairless guinea pigs. Again, inoculation, it results in very limited transcription. And by treating with tacrolimus, which is an immunosuppressant, you, and hormone, you can see reactivation of the virus and a severe infection. Now, more recently, they have tried to inoculate this virus into rat, and it becomes latent, latent and they have also been able to study pain signals. And my, uh, years ago, my mentor, Don Gilden, uh, started this. He tried to inoculate VZV into primates, both uh, xenomologous rhesus macaques, but it produces an abortive infection. So the, the abstract of this slide is, although you can get virus into these animals, the virus does not cause disease. It does not cause anything resembling what is happening in humans, including the non-human primate. However, there is a virus called simian varicella virus, which is monkey chicken pox, which causes exactly the same disease as humans. It causes fever, vesicular rash, and it occurs in epidemics. And just like kids, um, you know, monkeys have 7 to 21 days of infection, um, incubation. So this is a typical example, like a human chicken pox, and this is monkey chicken pox. As you can see, this is very similar. The virus becomes latent and it can cause, in this case, it's a human ophthalmic zoster and this uh, ophthalmic zoster in a primate. So we use this model. One of the things that we have done very recently in collaboration with Dr. Vicky Trainedorge over at the Primate Center in Tulane University, we were able to, we were able to, you know, uh, identify that that varicella rash, which is like between day seven to day 11 after inoculation, coincides with viremia. That viremia is virus DNA in the blood. And that coincided with virus in saliva. So we could take saliva and detect virus DNA along at the same time as we saw rash. So we are trying to develop this into uh, reactivation. And this has been done by Dr. Satish Mehta at NASA in uh, astronauts when they are in a very stressful situation when they shed virus, he is able to show the presence of virus in saliva. Just to summarize before I get into COVID, what we have shown with monkey uh, chicken pox or simian varicella virus, it's very similar in structure to the human virus. And in African green monkeys, it doesn't cause a disease like humans. It becomes a persistent infection. And macrophages and dendritic cells are infected and they transfer it to the T cells in the lymph node and it spreads to the rest of the body. However, if you expose the African green monkeys to the virus naturally, it becomes latent in neurons and you can reactivate. To our surprise, when we use rhesus macaques, it mimics the close, very close to what human disease is. Exactly like uh, children, they get chicken pox, it becomes all right, and then they reactivate. 
very recently, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Maria Nagel, we have identified that varicella infection in monkeys, the Alzheimer's markers, particularly the amyloid-related uh, markers, are increased in the cerebrospinal fluid in the monkeys. This is, we are very excited about it, and we are developing it as a model for Alzheimer's, viral etiology. Now, I'm going to switch gears completely and go into COVID, and particularly how the primate model is developing. To develop an animal model is extremely important because uh, normally when we get a pathogen, we inoculate you know, a culture, tissue culture, and we are able to get a lot of questions answered in a short time. We uh, ask, you know, what type, of, what type of cells they infect? You know, what is the timeline? What is, uh, you know, how, how, what kind of spread it happens? However, all of this is in the context of the absence of the immune system. So that is why we need to have an animal model because immune system play a big role in controlling the virus or in sometimes in even exacerbating the virus. This is a science article recently where it describes how mice, hamsters, ferret, monkeys, and uh, you know, are all being attempted to develop a model for COVID. Now, what is the criteria for an animal model? Particularly, you know, in this case, COVID-19. One, we need to replicate what's happening in humans. What are the aspects? One is route of infection. We know that virus goes through our uh, you know, saliva, through the orofacial route. So we need to mimic that in the animal model and see which animal model produce the same severity as human disease and also the levels of mortality and morbidity that it compares to the human system. And like we had a very nice discussion by uh, uh, Jay Sridhar Sharma on the nice receptors. So the distribution of receptors is very important. And uh, I'm learning a lot from Dr. Dr. Sharma about the receptors, uh, coincidentally. Now, we also must be able to correlate between virus titer because not all of us are going to be exposed to the same amount of virus. So in an animal model, it provides an opportunity to be able to use different amount of virus titer and see it, whether it has an effect on the severity of the disease. Now, one of the things that we, is very important is anytime you are using an animal model, you have to have reagents. We have experienced it a lot because a lot of the antibodies or any reagents that is commercially available, they are raised against humans or mouse or rabbits. So we need to have the proper reagents that will cross-react with the tissues that you're using. So the availability is very important. And another important feature we are learning is the demographics. We know that at one time, only people above 60 or 70 are more severely infected with COVID compared to the younger people. So that's another question. Are we going to be able to mimic the age differences in an animal model? Now, the last important factor is statistics. We all, you know, every one of you who have done research, you know that any time you are doing any animal studies, how many animals did you study and what is the percentage of animals that came down with the disease? So when you have to do large numbers of animals, in, in our case, we use primates, it's extremely important to consider the cost because we have animals that are like $6,000 each and $10 a day. So you know math, you can find out how much it costs, enormous amount of money. So we need to be very specific on how we are going to do the experiment to get maximum information. Now, recently, this was a very nice review in American Journal of Rontology, Rontogenology, where they compared SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. And there are some subtle differences in the infection pattern. Uh, most of the 
you know, the chills, dyspnea, malaise, they're all very common to all three viruses, virus infections. Whereas in, in COVID-19, diarrhea or nausea, vomiting, sore throat, those seem to be uncommon. So that seems to be absent in this. Now, another thing the, the radiologist noticed is when you look at the um, radiographs in the lung, there was a consolidation seen in COVID-19, but not much seen in other two viruses. And also, the fibrosis was not reported. I think it, uh, this, is, this I question because sometimes some references I have seen, but at that time, at least when they published, they said it's not reported. In any case, it is much less, more than uh, what they see in MERS. In other words, these three viruses have specific pathogenesis. There are subtle differences. Although they are coronaviruses, there seem to be some subtle differences in their pathogenesis. For that, animal model is important. As I was doing my literature survey, I found a very nice uh, consolidation of SARS and MERS. I thought this will be useful to go through to understand how um, animal models develop. If you look at the humans, both of the both humans, both, Mer, both MERS and SARS-CoV, you know, they have fever, respiratory illness, lung pathology, and uh, the unique thing about MERS is there is renal failure and lethality they have seen in MERS. That's not seen in SARS-CoV. One. Uh, now, they had used primates, uh, rhesus and cinemologous macaques, and African greens. The clinical signs and the replication pathology, they all seem to be dependent. In other words, that like African greens, we have also seen that in our virus, that African greens produce more robust infection compared to cinemologous or rhesus. And as for MERS, it is a transient infection and very moderate replication and mild lung pathology. But they have seen much more infection in marmosets, more severe infection, and virus, higher virus titers, uh, when you use higher virus titers. And again, just like humans, they could see lethality in this. Now, of course, cost decides that what kind of animals we use, and people have used mice. It turns out with SARS-CoV, one, the clinical science is seen only in, in older and inbred and mice, knockout mice, and also ACE2 transgenic mice. And they did see CNS disease in transgenic mice, but CNS disease was absent in SARS-CoV-1 in humans. But when they tried MERS in mice, there was no disease in inbred mice, and, uh, but they transduced the gene and show this clinical symptom. You could, you could develop that. Again, they were able to find a model for lethality. Now, coming to hamsters, yes, SARS-CoV-1 was, was uh, infecting and producing clinical disease. It worked well, but it did not, they did not support MERS infection, as was the case with ferrets. Again, ferrets were also used for SARS-CoV-1 with some success. Rabbits, for some reason, you know, no one has studied. And there was one report saying they are studying MERS in rabbits. The point of the slide is that there are several attempts to develop this model, and there are very experienced people. Dr. Subara was one of the labs, as I was doing, looking at the literature. She has done enormous amount of work in mice and, and even um, in primates, showing that African greens, you can get a robust infection. This is very useful in establishing the model for COVID. So what I'm going to do in the remaining time is to bring forth three important papers that I thought in, in highly visible journals. This one was from Harvard, where they used SARS-CoV-2 infection to, in rhesus macaques, and they even re-challenged the same animals to see how good a protection they get. This is very important because when you re-challenge, like the question, one of the questions that was asked to Ken was, can you get reinfected? So that, that answers, you know, this, this research uh, investigates that question. 
The second paper was from China where they looked at age as a factor. They used younger monkeys and older rhesus macaques to see if there was a difference. And in the another, oh, these are all within the last few months, published in the last few months. Uh, this paper again in science where they used COVID and MERS and compared it to already published result in SARS. This is a very nice comprehensive model to look at all three viruses. So let me take one paper at a time. In the first paper, they inoculated three different doses, 10 to the sixth, 10 to the fifth, and 10 to the four platforming units. And they found out that, you know, the RNA was investigated by uh, RT-PCR. And they found out that around day two post-infection, there was virus peak virus replication and slowly it was coming down by one week. But the amount of virus replicating in the nasal swab was not too different when they used different amounts of virus. And they also noticed that when they looked for utilizing antibodies, you know, this, these papers had enormous amount of data. Because of time, I just spoke, spoke uh, no, uh, specific data so that we get a flavor for the research, how it is done and what kind of results they get. And uh, in this case, I'm presenting the neutralizing antibodies. You know, just because somebody has an antibody to a pathogen does not mean that immediately they are going to feel better. The important thing is the neutralizing antibody. So they did that and they found out that the neutralizing antibodies were indeed uh, elicited here. And you can see that by about day 14, you can see substantial amount of in, and, uh, neutralizing antibodies on all three groups following the challenge. Now, the important thing is the lung because that is where we see a lot of effect with COVID-19 in the humans. This was a nice pathological study. They showed that about two days post-infection during the height of infection, there was necrosis in the lung. And also there are a lot of inflammatory cells in the, in the, in the lung walls. And they were able to do RNA in situ PCR and show that there is virus RNA in the area of inflammation two days post-infection. Now, another interesting thing about this paper is they challenged these monkeys, uh, they, they inoculated again as a re-challenge to see how the primates did. This is during primary infection in all these animals. As you can see, the virus peaks around two, two days post-infection. And when they challenged the monkeys again with COVID, they found out that there was some virus replication, but it just went down by day six. And here is an average. There was more virus primary replication and less during re-challenge. Another important thing in the neutralizing antibodies when they challenged about a week later, they had nice neutralizing antibodies in the region. So the bottom line message of this paper is the protection, yes, it's mediated by an immunological control. However, this is not sterilizing because if it were sterilizing, you wouldn't see virus here. It would have shut the virus down even before here, the immune system. So the model here in rhesus macaques tells us that the virus quantity did not make that big a difference. However, the challenge when you re-inoculate the virus, definitely you get protective immunity but it is not a sterilizing immunity. But there are a lot more things that can be done in this model. Now, I'm going to the second paper, which is very interesting. This was done in China, where they looked at younger group and older group of monkeys, younger group and elderly group. And they inoculated them with both intranasally and intratracheally. In all these studies, that the same route they used, they analyzed nasal swabs, uh, throat swabs, and anal swabs because they have people have seen even in humans in in stools, and they have even seen virus RNA in the sewer system. 
So they covered all, all possible uh, uh, areas to look for the virus. And as you can see, the, they were able to see a lot more virus in all swabs in elderly compared to the younger people. There was a little more. I wouldn't, you know, I was not very impressed with it, but they do claim that there is more virus replication. Now, one second paper, which is interesting, this was done in China, where they looked at younger group and older group of monkeys. Younger elderly group. And they inoculated them with both intranasally and intratracheally. In all these studies, that the same route swabs, uh, throat swabs, and anal swabs, because they have, people have humans in, in stools, and they have even seen virus RNA in the sewer system. So they can all, all possible uh, areas to look for the virus. And as you can see, the, they were able to see a lot more virus in all swabs in elderly compared to there was a little more. I wouldn't, you know, I was not very impressed with it, but they do claim that there is more virus replication. I have questions about that. However, when they look at different regions of the lung for the virus, there was definitely more virus in the elderly people. I mean, elderly monkeys, I'm sorry. Elder, elderly group compared to younger group. So virus replication is more in the the older group of animals. Even more interesting is the histopathology. When they do uh, hematoxylin eosin stain of the virus, as you can see, they're much milder. This is uh, you know average lung would look. Those of you who are not you know pathologists, there will be you know a lot of air pockets. However, in the older animals. There was a lot of um, information. There was not much air pockets here. So there is a lot of inflammatory cells here. And also, they saw many more antigen-positive macrophages in, in the lung, in elderly monkeys, older monkeys, compared to younger monkeys. So their bottom line message is definitely it causes more severe interstitial pneumonia in older animals compared to the younger animals. Now, in this paper, there's a last paper where this was from the Netherlands. Again, they, they, they did several things in this reading paper. They did several things. They looked at nasal and throat swabs, but both young animals. Now, as you can animal, the virus is less compared to the older animals, both in nail and many other people. And by 18, you can see the viruses, you don't see the virus RNA. Again, this is another interesting thing. Uh, and they also looked at asymptomatic shedding. I'll come to that in the next slide a little more. compared so we were and SARS-CoV-1. They did not do SARS-CoV-1, but they compared to previously published results. So that is the alveolar lumen, which, you know, with edema containing macrophages in this fluid. And there is very similar of they inoculate Now, very interesting that the thing that they did was 
they looked at the cages, several areas, the areas of the cage where the animals were, did not touch much, and there are other areas where they are climbing and touching a lot, and they checked their hands, and they also, the drinking nipple, they checked for virus. They found out that there is definitely even, you know, like between day 10 to 14, you can see in the area where these animals are touching, there is virus shedding. So they claim that this gives you an idea about, uh, you know, some animals which do not have the symptom, but they still shed the virus. So there is certain amount of asymptomatic shedding in these animals. These are the advantages of a good animal model. Now I'm going to uh, our own interest, uh, uh, Dr. Deshri Sharma and uh, Lucky Sarkar, and and using neem bark extract, showing that it uh, ameliorates the MHV induced inflammatory. We saw beautiful data presented by Dr. Sharma. So we want to take advantage of this. And uh, Dr. Meshri Das Sharma is heading this overall uh, uh, collaboration. So these are the questions, the goals that we are put together. Initially, we want to determine how coronaviruses establish primary infection. We want to identify just like these papers, what blood swab, saliva, blood tears, and see how we can optimize virus detection. I, I, we are really interested in working with saliva because we are finding that non-invasive uh, understand the virus detection. There's a group in New Jersey which have done a lot of uh, saliva testing on COVID-19 patients. So we also like to characterize the time code which is not still not in COVID-19 in any of these papers in, in using our model. Now, another important thing is we would like to use the New York track administration and look at viral feed and also direct introduction into gastric system because that is lucky circar difference. And finally, we can also find out the exact dosage. In particular, once uh, Dr. Darsharma find active compound, you know, which in my, because I, in my past life, I was a chemist, so I was always fascinated about it. One of these compounds, we can really find the dosage that is needed to clear the virus from multiple organs, including lungs, with minimal side effects. So this is, this is the overall direction we want to go. So what did I tell you today? I told you initially about some background about the virus, which has given us a lot of answers about human disease. Then I reviewed the current literature on SARS, MERS, and COVID. Very recently in Denver, I saw this very fascinating thing. They said, why is it important to study? You can ask many questions that is impossible to answer. You know, this was a good quote. The animal testing in scientists in see how the body reacts to the vaccine in ways, in states which never do that. So, so this is this sort of making a case for studying it in um, human primates. Just to finish up, uh, my SVV group, me and uh, Brittany Faya, but we always collaborate with Dr. Maria Nagel, Randy Kors, who has whom many of you might have seen in the meetings here, and Andrew Bubak is working on the Alzheimer's markers. Uh, all the thanks to Dr. Vicky Trainedarge and Peter Dahls, all the primate work they do. And Satish Mehta and Duane Pearson, we do a lot of saliva work with NASA, and we learned a lot there. Our long-time collaborator, Dr. Wayne Gray, he still works with simian varicella virus. And so we, we do collaborate. And I can thank Dr. Yeshi Dasharma and, uh, and uh, 
uh, isr -R for all the information that we are generating with the neem bark extract. And I have also collaborated with uh, Dr. Ilham Saudi in UC Irvine, who has done a lot of immunology. Uh, one thing I want to tell all the younger students and postdocs here is always collaborate with many people, try to understand as much as you can working with people who are experts in the field. That has helped me a lot. I am not an immunologist, but I'm able to learn by collaborating with Dr. Ilham Saudi and many others. And I'm not a clinician. I collaborate with Dr. Maria Nagel, who's a clinician. So she teaches me what's happened in clinic. And needless to say, I'm not a coronavirologist. And Dr. Jayashi Sharma teaches me a lot about coronaviruses. With that, I'd like to close. Thank you. Uh, hello, Nilakhi, are you there? Hello? Uh, okay. Uh, hello, uh, hello. There, are, there were some issues with the internet. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mahalingam, for your wonderful lecture. Uh, we can't use human beings to study a virus, therefore it becomes vital that we develop an animal model where we can study the pathogenesis by infecting the model with viruses. Very beautifully, Dr. Mahalingam uh, explained how the coronavirus spreads once inside the host. And uh, can I entertain, can I take some questions? Do we have any questions? Sure. I can take some questions. Okay. Hello, Dr. Sunil Khan. Dr. Sunil Khan. Yes. Yeah. One thing. Um, uh, thanks a lot for the lucid lecture of uh, Professor Mollingham. Uh, one Thank thing. You. One thing. Uh, as you show a slide of agar data, you, you just ask, can you just explain what is findings you have to get from the Nimbark? Oh, okay. We have not we have not started the name bark with animals yet. Uh, we are waiting for Dr. Jay Das Sharma to okay. finish her studies, and we are putting a flight. We have a proposal in play. Okay, one thing. Yeah, go ahead. Well, one thing. Uh, will you kindly? Be... Uh, the side of adjective which it, it was passed uh, so I cannot uh, see it properly okay, for a uh, mini uh, is, is, is for a minute can you check uh, it that, uh, your instruction could could have been uh, calculated uh, uh, one thing my question the, the slide which was shown it, it was passed very quickly. I could not uh, go through. Okay. If you can, uh, for a minute. Yeah, I can. Or, or as a director, as a director, as a director, slide. Just a three side before your. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? This one? Let me see. Hello. Let me see that the thing uh, before okay. that. Before one. Oh, then okay, I, okay. 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 I cannot go through. Yeah. This is a uh, this is a publication which Dr. Deshi Das Sharma it came out recently where she showed that uh, the extract, you know, Asadirakta indica, it uh, it removes, you know, it stops the mouse hepatitis virus induced uh, neuroinflammatory yes. disease. And they, it stops cell to cell fusion. And yes. she showed the, the data very nicely. Yes. That's why I went past because she showed the data. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Yes. We have another question from Dr. Biswajit Mondol. Kindly sure. explain the correlation between COVID and VZV in adults and adult humans. Yes. Now, this is a very, very interesting question because one of the things that we are even looking at, what happens is when, when COVID uh, infects adults, what we are noticing is there is almost a big cytokine storm. Now, the cytokine storm by itself, the virus doesn't do it. The, our reaction to the virus is so intense. 
Now it turns out that in VZV, when we have a latent virus during reactivation, there is all kinds of cytokines that are activated. And in fact, what we are finding during reactivation is the CXCL10 is, is expressed so highly in ganglia that the T cells are directly storming into the neurons. And what we think is this has a lot to do with the pain because people with VZV experience a lot of pain. And we believe two things. One, the cytokine dysregulation definitely is common to both VZV and COVID, definitely. And number two, what we are looking at right now, I wish you know, Dr. Maria Nagel was here. She would have loved this question because she is looking at it, that the substance P receptors are activated in VZV. And this is also something that we are testing for COVID. So there is a lot of commonalities the neurological aspects between these two viruses. Okay, any more questions? Okay, if we have no other questions, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mahalingam. Uh, thank thank you. you for bearing with us for the internet issue we had. Uh, we had a little, I apologize for that, for the little internet issues we had. Uh, okay, and uh, I thank you very much. It was an honor thank interacting you. with you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Dr. Devnath Pal. He is a computational biologist at the Indian Institute of Sciences, Bangalore. He pursued a PhD from National Chemical Lab, Pune, and Bose Institute, Kolkata. He then served as a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Molecular Biotechnology, Ziba, Germany, and a postgraduate researcher at the University of California, Los Angeles, USA. Currently, he is a professor at the Indian Institute of Sciences, Bangalore. Dr. Pal has been honored with the INSA Young Scientist Medal from the Indian National Science Academy, India, the Humboldt Research Fellowship from Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, Germany, the Nazi Scopus Young Scientist Award from the National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, and the prestigious Indo-US Joint R&D Network Center Award, IUSSTF. Dr. Paul has experience in structure function studies and has extensively studied the spike glycoprotein in murine beta coronavirus, MHV. Dr. Das Sarma and Dr. Paul have been collaborating on coronaviruses related studies. Today, Dr. Paul will discuss the in silico structure function analysis states of coronavirus spike protein that offer ideas for therapy design. Thank you. Dr. Paul? for the introduction and thanks for this invitation to share uh, the ideas that we have on uh, COVID-19. Uh, my slides are visible. Uh, it is still in the sharing mode. Uh, yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Right. It is the second slide, I think. Okay. Yes. okay. So, shall we get started? Uh, thank you again uh, for having me for this uh, webinar here. So, today I'm going to talk about the coronavirus uh, function analysis and ideas for therapy design. Uh, so my talk uh, will be a bit different from the previous talks. Uh, as you can understand, I'm a computational biologist and uh, I work uh, with structure, which means you know I go deep into the details of mass and try to understand you know, how they work and uh, try to design, uh, you know, ideas at, uh, you know, the structure functional relationships. So today, uh, outline my, of my talk will be on understanding uh, the structure, uh, you know, aspects of the spike protein 
and uh, so we'll really you know uh, go deep into the structure because it's a uh, it's a bit complicated uh, we will try to understand the mechanism of infection so that we get ideas for therapy and then we try to have spike protein uh, for eliciting in and then we'll move on to fusion peptides. So this part of the top will be devoted uh, uh, to work that we are currently pursuing. And the role of proline in fusion peptide. I'll conclude with arguments why peptides could be legitimate target for therapy. So let's uh, begin uh, with the basics. So I'm sure uh, you have seen uh, this, uh, you know, schematic many times. What I want to point here is uh, about the dimensions of the, uh, you know, objects that we are dealing with. So the SARS uh, virus is typically 500 angstrom to 2,000 angstroms. Uh, when it is budding, you know, it is typically 500 angstrom, and when it matures and grows, uh, you know, it is in size. And uh, you have many proteins uh, that are synthesized by the virus, but of those, the spike protein, the envelope protein, the membrane protein, the nucleocapsid protein. So these are the proteins which typically interact with the host surface when the infection has to begin, because these, as you can see, are exposed to the surface. And the goal of the virus is to inject the RNA into the host uh, so that you know, the infection and the replication process can start. So when we have to uh, you know, design a therapy, you know, there are several ways one can approach the problem. Okay, so these can be divided typically into four parts. The first is, uh, you know, we try to block the virus from binding to the human cell. So we essentially disable its recognition and uh, consequently we deny it an entry to the host. Uh, the second is we prevent the viral synthesis and replication. So this is post the viral entry. Uh, and the third is we try to, uh, you know, increase the host defense uh, by trying to restore its innate immunity and also try to boost, you know, uh, uh, defense by blocking specific receptors or enzymes in the host, you know, that work in synergy with the virus. So these in four strategies one can, uh, you know, pursue. Up today, we are essentially focusing on the first, which means ideas on trying to block the virus from binding to the human cell and deny it an entry. Okay. So when we try to do that, uh, you know, there are several questions that come up very naturally. And these are where to block, which means, you know, which protein target and in those proteins, you know, which specific sites to target and then how to block. Uh, so regarding how to block, we have to identify agents to block. So typically we are either, uh, you know, scouting for small molecules, peptides, or, you know, RNA, DNA, or even, you know, antibodies uh, for this purpose. So in the talk today, uh, I will be focusing on how to identify targets to block. So that will be the focus of my talk. Uh, how to identify agents is another story. And given the time constraints we have, uh, it will not be possible to cover all aspects. So before we understand you know, how to find a target, uh, we have to understand the protein itself. So in the talk today, I'm going to focus on the spike protein. As I already outlined, uh, four protein 
team that we, uh, you know, has the opportunity to interact with the host surface. These are the spike protein, the nucleocapsid protein, the membrane protein, and the envelope protein. So among these, the spike, as you can see, it juts outside, you know, uh, the virus surface quite a bit and is uh, typically the first, uh, you know, uh, one to interact with the host. So it is actually uh, known as the initiator infection. And as a result, uh, you know, it is also called the determinant of the virus infection and the viral entry. It is not a small protein. It's actually a very big protein, uh, about 1300 amino acids in length. And uh, more so, the protein exists in the form of a trimer, okay? So the big, uh, you know, uh, the big uh, spike-like thing that you see is actually composed of uh, three units, three subunits of the protein. And the protein is divided into two parts. Uh, one is the S1 unit, is the S subunit. Subunits serve purpose for recognition, and the S2 unit serves the purpose for uh, fusion. So, uh, depending on whether we want to prevent the host uh, uh, virus attachment, we would have to target the S1 subunit, and if we want to prevent uh, from the fusion, then we have to target the S2 unit. The spike protein. So we really know, you know, uh, in the S1 subunit, which part of the molecule binds to the host receptor. In the case of SARS, uh, we know that uh, the major receptor, uh, you know, in, in, the, in uh, SARS-CoV-2, the major receptor is the uh, ACE2, and there are some other receptors also which are known to bind. Uh, so. In the talk today, uh, what I'll try to do is I'll try to, uh, you know, make you understand, you know, about the structure of the spike and then give you ideas, you know, how people are thinking about therapy uh, that targets the spike. Uh, as you, can, uh, you know, each and every part of the primary structure of the protein has been assigned, you know, slave. For example, HR1, as you can see here, it re refers to heptide repeat one. So this is a part of the protein which is very important for fusion. And here you can see it's written RBD, which means receptor binding domain, which means this part of the protein molecule actually attaches itself physically with the host receptor. What is also interesting, uh, so, uh, I have also provided you with some data on uh, SARS-2, which means the current COVID-19 uh, virus, and SARS-1 that we had in 2003 and 4. And what you will appreciate is that uh, the viruses uh, have undergone uh, quite a change in their genome. Uh, actually, the SARS-1 uh, genome 80% with the SARS-2 genome, and the spike protein, about 70% identical. And as you can see, uh, uh, you know, different parts of the spike protein has diverged differently. For example, the ribosome domain has diverged, and only 74.6% remains identical with the one protein. So this way you can actually analyze each part of the structure and find out you know, how much is identical to the uh, spike protein from the SARS-1 on which you know, substantial studies have already been done. So once we have learned a little bit about the spike protein, uh, let us see you know, what are the modes of infection. Because once we understand the modes of infection, then we can you know, intelligently design uh, an appropriate uh, strategy for therapy. So the infection pathway for uh, the SARS 
uh, is typically uh, in two, two ways. The first is uh, a direct entry, you know, it is shown as fusion pathway one, wherein uh, the RNA is injected into the host directly from the, uh, by rupturing the surface, okay. And then uh, the other is to, through an endosomal pathway, where uh, the virus, uh, you know, gets into the host, uh, forms an endosome, and then uh, through the endosome, the RNA is injected. And then, you know, the virus replicates and then it it's, uh, goes out again. So we, if we have to design a strategy, the strategy, you know, uh, has to work before the RNA uh, is injected. And that's one stage. And the other stage is uh, when it is being, uh, you know, uh, uh, let out from the host again, that is uh, in step eight and nine. So in these uh, two places, uh, we have an opportunity to block the virus. And uh, for that, we need to figure out, you know, where we should target. So uh, a lot of people have been working with the spike protein, trying to understand, you know, how it enters. So very recently, we have a paper in Cell uh, which says that uh, there are two sites in the spike protein that are cleaved. And once these sites are cleaved, then uh, the cell entry, the host cell entry is highly enhanced. Uh, now, as a strategy, uh, as you can understand, when uh, we have to design uh, therapy, we can target also the cleavage sites. Okay, so this is very important. So this is an information that allows uh, one to understand where to target. Now, what has been suggested is that in the already infected cell, uh, the newly uh, synthesized spike, you know, is pre-activated by cleavage at the S1, S2 site. And then uh, once it attaches to the new target cell, you know, there is another cleavage at the S2 prime site, which makes it a very efficient, you know, uh, infector. So this uh, new pathway is being uh, proposed as to why, you know, the virus uh, is very infective and it's spreading uh, very rapidly. So as a designer of therapy, one needs to understand the intricacies of the structure, okay? So here is a glimpse of the structure. One need not have to have to go into the details. So I have a small cartoon on the left-hand side. So this is what is important, okay? So on the top, you have the S1 domain. This is the receptor binding domain. And the S2 is the fusion domain. So according to the current, uh, you know, understanding of the mechanism, the top part must go and the S2 uh, part must then act as a, you know, uh, as a pincer and gets into the membrane. So you can either target S1 or you can target S2. So what we did we started analyzing the uh, spike structure and we have been using the mouse hepatitis virus as our you know, template to get into the details, okay? The reason why we have been trying to use the mouse hepatitis virus is because uh, you know, it has a lot of commonality with the SARS-CoV uh, spike and the SARS-CoV-2 spike and uh, just like SARS-CoV-2, uh, you know, it also has a S1, S2 cleavage site, which is not common with SARS-CoV-1, which does not have an S1, S2 cleavage site. So one needs to understand that a detail is very important in this case. So what I'll do is, I'll first take you to the multiple sequence alignments, okay? 
Now this is a very busy slide. What you need to only focus is on the red strips. Okay, the red strips tell you positions where the virus, uh, you know, the sequences of each of the virus in the spike protein are identical. So as you can see, that a very small fraction of the protein is identical. So this fraction typically varies from anywhere to 33% to 77%. So that is the divergence. So as a biologist, I'm sure you're aware that we typically try to do what is called a multiple sequence alignment. And we try to find out where one must target uh, you know, a certain uh, you know, inhibitor to get some therapeutic response. But this is a big problem in the spike protein. The reason is very small identity in the sequence. So that is where the principal difficulty lies. So what are people doing in this front? Okay, so we are fortunate that nowadays, uh, unlike uh, you know, few years back, we have cryo-electron microscopy. So the cryo-electron microscopy is now allowing us to actually solve these structures in three dimension. So in the previous slide, you know, I had shown you these large structures. These were all solved from cryo-electron microscopy. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to integrate the sequence information with the structure information and trying to see you know not only the sequence is matching where the properties of the residues can also match so which means we are going a bit a step ahead and trying to understand the properties here is one example on the right hand side there is a, a spike protein that you have from SARS-CoV-2 in this protein, you know, it is shown that there are three receptors, the green ones, of which two are in closed form, and the other one, the blue one, is in the open form. Now, what this suggests is that the receptor binding domain in the spike is very flexible. Okay, it can adapt, it can rotate. Okay. So now when we are going to design our therapeutic molecule, we have to think about specificity. So if there's a lot of flexibility in our target uh, region, then we would not be able to make a very specific you know, uh, uh, inhibition. So what we try to do is to see how we can figure out which are the most appropriate places to target. Now, this is one example from the literature where they are trying to target the receptor binding domain. And how they are trying to target the receptor binding domain? They have designed a peptide mimic, which is uh, you know, uh, similar to a small part of the AC2 protein, and that can go and bind to the uh, uh, receptor binding domain of the spike. And as soon as it does that, uh, the spike protein will not be able to recognize the host receptor. And then, you know, it will not be able to in uh, infect. Now this approach is, uh, you know, nice, but uh, one can understand that uh, the drugs that we take will be present inside the cell. Whereas when the virus infects us for the first time, you know, it infects us from the outside. So uh, to have uh, these uh, peptides on the surface of the protein would require us to tag it with certain other sequences such that it is available on the host surface. So this adds to the complexity of the design. So we need to think and try to get more simpler targets. So that is one of the reasons the receptor binding domain is not the most 
uh, you know, sought after uh, target for inhibition. Rather, the S2 domain is believed to be the more, you know, uh, amenable one. So what is the anti-fusogenic model that we know? So here, I'm showing you the spike protein in two forms, the pre-fusion form and the post-fusion form. The pre-fusion form, uh, as you can see, uh, the structure you know, exists in a trimer state where there are lots of loops in between the helices. But when it has undergone a conformational chain into a post-fusion state, it has become into primarily three main helices and then three small helices surrounding this. This is called a six helix bundle. And the idea for designing an inhibition is very simple here. So what people are trying, people are essentially trying to you know, create small peptides, which are similar to the one of the helices. Which means if it is similar to one of the helices, then it will go and bind to the other helix. And if it does that, then it will prevent the original helix from the protein to bind. And that way it will prevent the post-fusion confirmation to be attained. Now, what is the critical part of the design? The peptide must be such, such that these peptides don't, themselves don't become uh, a trimer by themselves, but they must go and target the spike protein alone. So many people have tried this option. And, uh, you know, we have in literature uh, several anti-fusogenic -fuso peptides. Some of these are also currently under clinical trial. And, uh, you know, uh, these, as you can find out, uh, mostly from the peptide name, these are all targeting the S2 domain. And most of them are targeting the heptide repeats. The reason they are targeting the heptide repeats is because heptide repeats are the only part of the spike protein that are most conserved among all parts of the spike protein. So when we are able to target the heptide repeat, uh, the chances that you know uh, it can survive uh, the as a drug in different in new mutants that arise is higher. And we can see that all these have been, uh, you know, also uh, tested experimentally, and uh, the inhibition uh, constants have been found out. And of these, there's only one here, uh, which is in a nanomolar range. So if we have an inhibition in nanomolar range, which means it is very effective. So now the question is that uh, a lot of effort is being spent on targeting the spike protein and people are focusing either on the you know the um, heptide repeats or you know uh, the receptor binding domain are there any other areas of the spike protein that can also be useful for therapy so that is the question that we want to ask so in this context, we have been working with the fusion peptides. Okay, the fusion peptides, uh, you know, are part of the spike protein. These are small segments inside the spike protein, which are membranotropic. Okay, when I say membranotropic, it means that these parts have properties such that when the protein you know, is inserted into the membrane, it is easily done, okay? There are many ways to find the membranotropic segments of the protein. Uh, these are typically done uh, by trying to find out uh, how often hydrophobic residues are present and in what order. And here is one example that I have uh, 
I'm showing from one of the papers published in 2016, where they have used a popular membrane detection program to find out the location of uh, the fusion peptides. And as you can see that, you know, all these uh, proteins have a segment which is highly membranotropic. So the question is, can these be targeted? So if one were to do such an exercise on uh, the um, S2 domain of the spike protein, and instead of using uh, one hydrophobic scale, one hydrophobicity scale, uh, use several other hydrophobicity scales that are currently available to test the uh, protein uh, segments, then one can see that there are four such segments in the spike protein. And of these, uh, three are actually on the surface. And the fourth one is buried uh, deep near the transmembrane domain. So in this uh, slide, because of uh, you know, the large size of the sequence, I could not give all the uh, full alignment. So that the another fusion peptide is present near the transmembrane domain. So now the question is whether these present us with a legitimate surface for uh, inhibition. So what I've done here, I have taken uh, the spike structure and I'm showing you six such, such structures where the uh, individual fusion peptide surfaces are marked. What you can see is that in all cases, these are surface exposed. So since they are surface exposed, then they are easily accessible for inhibition. But having said so, you know, one needs to understand that not any surface is amenable for a therapeutic, uh, you know, approach. So what was, what must one see and uh, determine before one can proceed uh, for such a therapeutic approach? So in this context, proline is very important, okay? Why proline is important? Because in each of those uh, fusion peptides, uh, at least in one of them, there was what is called a central proline. Okay. What is a central proline? Central proline is essentially uh, a residue that is sitting right around the midpoint of the fusion peptide stretch. And this central proline is not present, not only present in the uh, SARS and the MERS uh, viruses, these central prolines are present in many other viruses, which are also quite infectious, okay? So uh, here's one example from uh, the ENV virus, where people have shown that if they uh, mutate this uh, proline, then it leads to alteration in its uh, fusion behavior, okay? In Ebola virus, this is very important, okay? There are two prolines, in fact, and both have been mutated. And it has been found that uh, if, uh, you know, if you mutate uh, these uh, prolines, then you know, there is alteration of uh, the fusogenic activity. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, it is, it is the abrogation of the fusion potential of the respective full length microproteins. Okay, so proline 537 has been found to be more important than the proline 533. Okay, so there are, as I said, there are many other viruses with central prolines. A VSV virus is one, okay, vesicular stomatitis virus, tick bone encephalitis virus, simian foamy virus, mouse hepatitis virus, but most importantly, the SARS and the MARS also have central prolines. So this is the uh, uh, point of interest 
uh, to us. So why is proline so important? So uh, to understand why proline is so important, one needs to go back to the basic structure of the proline residue and needs to look at the Ramachandran plot, which we typically uh, you know, come across in textbooks. What we find is that the proline residue, because it is an amino acid and not an amino acid, has a very restricted uh, you know, uh, ability to uh, rotate. So when I say rotate, it, I'm talking about the phi angle and the psi torsion angles in the backbone of the protein. Now, I understand that many of you may not be from structural biology background, uh, and you may not be knowing about phi and psi angles in the protein. Uh, so what one must realize is that the polypeptide backbone you know, is a long polymer. And uh, as any uh, you know, CC single bond can rotate, the phi and the size are defined around these freely rotatable bonds. So proline, uh, you know, has a restricted uh, C alpha N bond. So as I can, I can show you, these are the freely rotatable bonds. But in this case, because here it is around, uh, you know, it is, it is a cycle here, this bond is no more rotatable. If this bond were broken, this bond will become rotatable. So because of presence of proline inside the protein backbone, when the, the backbone is also restricted. Okay. So uh, in collaboration with Dr. Jayashree Das Sharma, you know, who, they created, you know, recombinant strains of uh, viruses in which uh, one had one you know, everything was same, except in one, uh, the wild type, there were two prolines in the fusion peptide. And uh, she had mutated and deleted one of the pro, uh, you know, prolines in a, another virus. And as you can see, that just by deletion of one proline, you know, the syncytia formation, which is an indicator of the fusogenicity and the infectivity of the virus has dramatically come down. And this is a snapshot at 12 hours. Okay. So one amino acid has dramatically changed the pathogenic potential of the virus. And the reason is that this has to do with the structure and function of the molecule and proline is contributing majorly towards this aspect. So as a computational biologist, what we typically do is we you know, develop structural models where we incorporate the changes and we subject these to molecular dynamic studies. In molecular dynamic studies, uh, essentially what we get to understand is you know how the parts of the molecules are moving, how the conformation can change over time, and if these conformational changes can uh, you know affect the function. So, for MHV, uh, we can see that if we had a double proline, you know the conformation was restricted, which means that there were not too many uh, you know, different structures. Uh, I must here alert to you about the fact is that many of you see uh, structures of protein molecules downloaded from the protein data bank, and you see only one structure. So because they, those are crystallographic structures, they are only a snapshot of all possible structures of the protein molecule. So uh, when you do a molecular dynamics, you are essentially able to find out how many different you know, 
possible structures the, that protein can attain. And these structures uh, not necessarily are too different from the original structure that you may see in the, uh, from the protein data bank. So when we did the molecular dynamic study, we found that the proline, double proline case had a very stable structure. And when we removed the proline, then the structures became very floppy. And when the structures became very floppy, the fusogenic potential of the virus dramatically declined. Okay. We had done, uh, you know, we had taken this uh, peptide, small peptide uh, consisting of 16 amino acids uh, of this uh, very uh, uh, fus uh, you know, fusion peptide stretch and also done NMR. And what we found was that this, because the presence of proline, this uh, peptide is also able to undergo what is called a cis-trans geometric isomerization, which means that uh, the peptide uh, plane can flip. And because of this, uh, some structural rearrangement can take place very easily. So we did study the small fragment of the uh, fusion peptide you know, rigorously. And what we found out was that whenever a proline is there, you know, there is restriction of the peptide backbone. And when there are two consecutive prolines, one after the other, then the restriction of the backbone is even more. And this affects not only the structure locally, it affects the global structure as well. So we have done similar studies using the SARS and the MERS uh, you know, uh, viruses. And because you can see the MERS has a proline here, the SARS has two prolines here, and the SARS-CoV has a proline here, you know. So these fusion peptides, whenever, you know, proline is present, gets highly restricted. The original structure of these, uh, you know, uh, peptides in the protein, you can see they're all small stretches of turn. So T denotes turn segments, okay? Unlike other fusion peptides in the protein, where there are stable structures like helices. Okay, so you can see stable structures like helices. So when there is already a helix there, then due to the presence of hydrogen bond, these structures are already stabilized. Compared to the fact when there are small uh, secondary structure elements like turns or irregular structures, if a proline is present there, then it imparts a rigidity to that structure and making it you know, more stiff and also imparting the global structure some kind of a uh, you know, order. So having done this, we have now focused our attention on trying to find out you know, where these must bind on the protein surface. So what I'm showing you is uh, uh, places on the protein structure that these uh, fusion peptide surfaces point to. And these uh, red and the blue colors and the white colors signify, the red signify a highly negative charged region, the blue signifies a positively charged region, and the white signifies a neutral region. And you can see that each of these structures, there are grooves. And in these grooves, these uh, red or the blue colors are shown. So now our goal is how to find an agent. And this could be a peptide, or this could be a small molecule that can come and attach itself to any of these surfaces. And if it is able to do that, then it is going to uh, you know, alter the fusogenic potential of the, uh, of the um, uh, spike protein by disallowing it to alter its conformation. 
and if it is able to do that then it is potentially stop the cell to cell spread and the consequent infectivity so in conclusion what did we learn we learned that spike proteins are very diverse and finding a common feature is key to understanding their structure function relation many people have studied these proteins and have used certain parts of the spike protein such as the receptor binding domain or the heptad repeats to design therapies what we are proposing that fusion peptide surfaces are also legitimate targets for therapeutic intervention and since these surfaces are always exposed no matter uh, the spike protein is cleaved or not they could also be a potential you know uh, of potential use for vaccine development what is most important is that a specificity uh, of structure and in this uh, context the presence of proline is most important because proline imbibes rigidity to the protein backbone and allows a receptor surface on which your binding agent be a small molecule or an rna or a peptide molecule can go and bind specifically so in a nutshell uh, what did we learn today we learned about the spike protein we saw that you know it has many parts to its function but of that fusion peptides are very critical because they are the agents for membrane fusion and if we are able to find an agent to block those surfaces then uh, we are likely to land up with an effective therapeutic design uh, with that i will end uh, this work that we are doing uh, is in collaboration with uh, professor das sharma's lab and i presented some data and this data were you know uh, obtained by uh, manmeet abhinoy and sriparna from dr das sharma's lab and uh, uh, dibujyoti sunanda uh, krishnarjuna and ragothama from in instr of science i thank you for attention and be happy to take questions uh thank you very much sir for your nice and elaborate presentation regarding the spike proteins and letting us know the detailed structure molecular structure of the spike proteins which are actually associated with the infection so it will help us to design uh, like therapies and drugs thank you very much it was so well elaborated and well presented now we would like to uh, take questions uh, dr shebanti gupta uh, is um, waiting to ask a question please dr gupta go ahead okay thank you it was a nice presentation can you hear me yes please yeah so i want to know that uh, the that you have uh, you know shown the spike s1 and s2 cleavage is done by murine and as far as i know uh, that is not uh, uh, the same for the covid one basically this is a splicing site for uh, purine that's uh, for covid 2 not for covid 1 so what's the uh, does it have any effect on the sporadic nature i mean uh, the because the sars cov is cov cov 2 is spreading in faster rate in comparison to cov 1 so uh, whether that has any kind of implication this splicing site has any kind of implication yeah so uh, so this question uh, you know many people are trying to understand this question huh. and the spectrum of answers are varied mm -hmm. so for example uh, as i showed you uh -huh. in uh, murine coronavirus in mhva 59 there are papers 
which have shown that if you have cleavage, then you get an infection. But even when you do not have cleavage, you still get infection. Okay. Uh, now what has happened is that uh, over the time people have accumulated a lot of data. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is now an understanding that it may not be essential for the virus to cleave to be able to infect. The reason is that the receptor binding domain is not very tightly bound to the fusion domain. I have shown you one structure when the receptor binding domain is in the open conformation. The receptor binding domain attaches with the fusion domain through a very long linker sequence. Okay, so which means that when actual fusion is going to take place, then it is not necessary that the uh, receptor binding domain, which will still, still sit on top of the fusion binding domain and cap it. Okay. It might just as well come apart and you know stay aside and allow the fusion process to proceed. Okay. The kinetic rate of that reaction is likely to be slower than the cleaved uh, entity. Mm -hmm. So that is what uh, the um, data suggest. And as you can see that now people are saying that you cleave S1, S2 first, and after that you cleave S2 prime. When you cleave S1, S2, and you follow it up with S2 prime, then the efficiency of fusion even increases. Mm -hmm. The reason is that the conformational transition becomes uh, less constrained by the associated S1 domain. Okay, so the transition can happen much faster and because of that, you know, the infectivity increases. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just, I want to know whether, the, whether being a furin splicing site does increase the, I mean, uh, faster cleaving? Yes, in com of I mean, course. Of any, absolutely. Any cleavage site. So, as I said, the faster you can get rid mm -hmm. of uh, the S1, the S2 is free to change its conformation and fuse. Mm. So if you have not only the furin site, you have the S2 prime site. In fact, there are many other uh, um, arginines there. So arginines, mm. as you free know, arginines. trypsin, yeah, yeah. Free, free arginines. So trypsins are sites for those, uh, you know, uh, cleavage. Mm. So if there's a trypsin in the environment, uh, in the endosome, it will simply cleave it. Mm -hmm. And if it cleaves it, S2 is free to go and fuse. So that is how the, the understanding is, 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 you know, we are getting an understanding on that. Uh -huh. And I have one more question just to, uh, it's a curiosity that uh, when you're talking about uh, therapeutics uh, targeting the fusion protein, so, sorry, fusion peptide in case of uh, this uh, spike protein, uh, what kind of, uh, I mean, what kind of compound to use? Any kind of chemical compound like small molecule or it's kind of antimicrobial peptide? Um, so there are several strategies. Uh, one cannot say a priori which strategy is, is uh, the best, the perfect one. So um, if we were to use peptides, then uh, uh, the strategy called stapled peptides mm -hmm. are the most you know, amenable strategy because if you take a linear peptide, then linear peptide uh, can uh, have more conformational freedom, right? Mm -hmm. So it can, uh, may not exist in the specific structure that will actually go and bind to the um, fusion peptide mm -hmm. site. So typically, if you are going to take a peptide-based, uh, you know, approach, you have to use stapled peptide. That will make your approach more robust. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, for a small molecule, uh, you know, because there's a hydrophobic, uh, you know, uh, site, you can design your, uh, you know, ligand, small ligand that you're going to use that. Mm -hmm. so this is what. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shebunti Gupta. Her, herself, she is a uh, she is an assistant professor in Inepoya Research Center. She herself is associated with the viral involved COVID-19 infection, and she is a structural biologist as well. Uh, we had her lecture yesterday in the session. Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta.
Thank you. We may uh, take another question because we are running out of time. We may uh, take another one question. Uh, there was a question from uh, Mrs. Shaila Jatiwari. Uh, she was uh, that. Thank you, sir, for the explaining such briefly. Uh, my question is: How can CRISPR help in finding vaccine for SARS-CoV-2? Oh, so CRISPR Cas is a you know it's a genome you know editing method, right? So here. Um, you know, CRISPR will have a very limited role because uh, typically we would want to do something on the host, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm sure, uh, you know, in future, if uh, SARS, uh, you know, uh, becomes a very critical, uh, you know, uh, very critical, uh, you know, infection, then one might think of uh, introducing some designer, uh, you know, sites in our genome that can boost our immunity with respect to, uh, you know, uh, SARS-CoV infection. But insofar doing anything on the virus, I don't see CRISPR uh, has any role. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir, for answering the question. Mm -hmm. There is one more question, very simple one from our undergraduate students. Like uh, two of our students asked the same question that if we can change, if possible, we can change uh, the structural spike protein, the spike glycoproteins. So can we prevent uh, in this way the interaction with the host and the sector? Oh, so the answer is very simple. S uh, structure is related to function. So any change that you make in the structure is likely to alter the function. Okay, so that's the uh, uh, basic rule. And that is what we call in computational biology sequence, structure, function, relationship. Now the question is that where you have made that change and how much that change is going to alter the function. So if you have made a change in such a position it dramatically alters the function, as we have shown in our slide, that we change one prolein, and it dramatically changed the behavior of the spike protein and its infectivity. But if you would have made a, a change in some other place, which was not as important, then you may not uh, have seen uh, such alteration. So it is related, but the site of the change is also very important. Okay, thank you, sir, for answering the questions. Now, uh, we can have other questions, but not right now. Uh, participants can put questions in chat box or email us. We can get back to you with the answers. We can email the uh, questions to the, uh, to the speakers and we'll get back to you. Now, I would like to uh, uh, conclude the session. I'd like to uh, thank all the speakers from, the globe, from around the globe for their valuable, informative, and interesting and elaborative uh, presentations and illuminating us with the um, elaborate knowledge in a situation like this when uh, the whole world is facing this pandemic. And if we know better, then we understand better, then we can fight the disease better. Now, I'd like to also thank our organizing committee uh, for their efforts and our principal madam for continuous for our continuous encouragement and support and my heartfelt thank to all the participants uh, that are joining us today that have joined us today uh, thank you all now i'll request our host dr shutishmita chakravarti to close the session officially thank you thank you all thank you dr roy uh, i think we had a wonderful session today and the interaction was also very effective uh, we did have a little glitch, I know. It was raining hard and uh, there was some thunderstorm also. So there was a little connectivity issue, but rest, uh, we made it well. I thank one and all for this, uh, the August gathering, uh, for your support and for making this a successful event. Thank, thank you all. Four, two, three. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, we have taken one, but I'll request all of you to put on your uh, videos so that we can take another snap of yours.
give me a second right yes all participants can switch on their video now show me lee dr khan all right we take a snack right now yeah say cheers okay thank you very much and with this uh, i'll end my end the meeting here thank you again to everyone for being there and for making this a grand success thank you thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank thank you. all the organizers all the thank you suchismita thank you sir thank you we are on good time